call the select board meeting to order. Today is June 25th, 2019. Uh, on tonight's agenda, we'll have liaison reports. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we are being aired by RCTV Studios on Verizon Channel 33 and Comcast Channel 22. Keep this over here. Um, tonight, we'll be having liaison reports followed by the town manager report and then public comment. On the agenda for tonight, we have a hearing for a tree removal. Then we'll have the new police officer pinning ceremony. We'll be hearing from recreation on the Birch Meadow survey results. They were then being asked to approve some renovations to the train depot. We'll also have a general discussion on train depot parking fees. This is a preliminary discussion on the topic. Uh, we'll then go into town manager goals. And then we're also having a preliminary discussion on ways to make the town greener, more eco-friendly. We'll go to future agendas and then potentially executive session. Um, all right, with that, uh, we'll start with liaison reports. Andy, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, ever dependent on, on my laptop here. Um, first, I wanted to note, uh, my bad, the, the office hours in August will, will be held by me on August 10th, not the 16th. I didn't get back to Bob in time. So it's August 10th. It'll be at Cafe Nero, 930 to 1030. And it will, I'm sure we'll change that. Uh, moving forward, a um, lot of went to a lot of um, le you know um, board and committee meetings this week, but I put it all in your in the um, in the packet except for I didn't go to the board of health meeting. I watched it after the fact, and just to give a quick summary, um, they the, the majority of the meeting they discussed the following agenda item. Bear with me because it's long revising monthly health agent report to include a detailed spreadsheet that will be reviewed at every meeting of violations cited during inspections and link spreadsheet to the health page on a town website. And um, they, a tough one, huh? it is. And if you ever put that in something like, like that in our <laughs> agenda, I pull my hair out. Um, now, anyway, um, it was discussed and uh, they did not um, uh, come to a conclusion. Um, busy month with a lot of different meetings. Um, just some highlights. So I, uh, I'm the liaison to the audit committee. The town received a clean audit again this year, meaning there was no management letter that was issued. Um, one uh, open issue, and I've talked a little bit to Bob about this one, is that the um, some of the funds, the OPEP funds, um, are invested in um, in CDs largely. There may be an opportunity to invest them in a different system. It requires some some legal work to be completed and some feedback probably from the town in terms of what has to happen to make that happen. The town being staff the town, the town being, being uh, the town account. Okay. And so um, I think that one just needs to be on the kind of the front burner to, to get done just so that the investments can be scheduled a little bit. Um, but the, the audit was clean. It was actually very good. The other thing uh, is that the auditor indicated that many of our practices are uh, I don't know if state of the art is the right way to put it, but we're, we're certainly with or leading our peers, including things like contributions to OPEB and some other some other activities. Okay. Uh, we asked if there were any areas where we're lagging. They didn't indicate that there were there were any. The one thing that's very interesting, if, if someone decides they want to look at the audit report, is now the the OPEB, the entire balance of OPEB, is on the balance sheet, which is this massive number that, that looks a little scary. Um, it's always been there. It just now has to be put into the statements. It hasn't changed. And we're, we're funding it slowly, but we're funding it regularly. So that's all good. Uh, second, I attended a Council on Aging meeting, which was, uh, and Vanessa uh, joined me for that meeting as well. Uh, great chance to uh, understand some of the issues that they're dealing with. Um, I started out talking a little bit about learning more toward a senior center at some point. Um, and that we had that discussion very briefly. Then there was a discussion of concerns that they had, which was great. One of them is going to come up uh, regarding parking. And what came up specifically is that there is a discount for seniors for the compost area, but not for parking at the depot. And it used to be that there was one for parking at the depot. So they requested that we have a discussion about that. So we can, we can bring that up a little bit later. Um, Economic Development Committee, subcommittee, 
Um, Andy and, and I are on that subcommittee. Um, we've had a couple of meetings with the focus being to review some of the past efforts and to be able to interview some of the past members. Um, and I've since the, the board, the subcommittee instructed me to have some of those discussions. Bob and I met briefly once as well. There's also a downtown district uh, effort that is starting. We have a consultant. Uh, we got a grant for a consultant. They're very focused on execution of some downtown activities. I attended a, a meeting of that group, which was very um, helpful, thinking about uh, issues related to some of the downtown businesses, as well as um, not so many residents yet. And, and that group's focus is to figure out who should be involved in a downtown discussion. The Economic Development Committee is a different effort, although I think we'll learn a lot from this downtown district effort. Um, and I think it would be good to get onto the agenda probably for August, if we could, to, to talk about what's kind of some, some of what we've learned. And then I think our mission is to come back to the board with suggestions on how to create the committee and who the membership should be. So I think August is about the right time frame for that. Okay. You forgot the biggest point on that one. Please. Who was elected chair? Oh. Yeah, we had, we had in a close vote. I was elected chair of the subcommittee. Glad it's big. Briefly, but could I take a, a moment just for personal privilege, just for a second? So two things. One, the running 375, I thought, was an outstanding effort by people in this town. It was very well attended. It was wonderful. I, I thought it was just fantastic. All the different things. Things were very well attended. Um, Porch Fest, which allowed music to be in 45 or so different venues, was amazing. I think it should be an annual. I think that's what they're thinking about, which would be wonderful. There was another effort or activity this past weekend called Jams for Jake that was also really good. Um, this was formed by some friends of a, a young man in town who died uh, of an overdose a few years ago. And they put on a music festival to raise money for scholarships and other activities. Um, it, it's a great group of folks. Uh, they had a concert that they had the Birch Meadow Fields, which was great this year. The only thing that they need is more people to come. And that would be wonderful if we can figure out how to, how to help them with that effort going into the future. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so just to go briefly over what I had included in the um, not everyone uh, watching at home <coughs> or in, in person has access to the packet. Um, but I attended a library board of trustees meeting and uh, one thing they asked me to highlight in my liaison report is that summer reading has kicked off so invite all residents to uh, to visit the library they have not just set up summer reading programs for children but also for adults um, the Tarrant lean development um, meetings held by the Wakefield Board of Appeals have uh, have They've postponed the hearing twice now, uh, so I don't really have any new updates there. Uh, Andy and I have been co-chairing the Human Rights Board ad hoc committee. Um, at our at our last meeting, uh, we reviewed the the research that uh, members had conducted on the structure of other communities, organizations, and we plan to reach out to Reading community organizations with an eye towards conducting focus groups to make sure that we're um, hearing from folks who are not at the table. Uh, the Human Relations Advisory Committee um, asked that I highlight that they are in need of new members um, and they invite members of the public to attend their meetings if, if, if they have any interest, um, you know, before making a commitment as to whether they'd like to join the group. I, I also was not uh, able to attend the, the um, Board of Health's meeting last week, but I did correspond with the chair um, about the, the pesticide regulations and if they needed more guidance from us um, and uh, the ch and the chair uh, Kevin Sexton indicated it, it would be fine if if our board wanted board members wanted to send our written feedback to them. Um, and then Vanessa, I don't want to necessarily. Would you like to speak to our subcommittee? Which, You're welcome. To okay. <laughs> um, Vanessa and I met last week uh, for our first, not Vanessa's <coughs> first, but my first subcommittee on. Um, on our, our, our board's communications policy. And we um, will be meeting again on July 3rd to go over, um, we're each going to plan to bring to our next meeting 
um, some thoughts about a policy on closing the loop with residents who reach out by way of email, uh, as well as making sure that we're providing um, more consistent guidance to the town manager about management of email and that, and that kind of thing. So I guess the first part of liaison report is I have been negligent in sending my liaison reports in writing to Bob. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, what everyone else feels about continuing the practice of written liaison reports. We can talk about that later. Um, so I have several from the last couple of weeks. Uh, first, the ZBA um, had Weston Sampson, who's out at uh, Walker's Brook, they want to install a sign um, on top of the building. Options are being explored for exact placement. At Recreation, the Friends of Running Tennis is um, considering giving a gift to repair some of the tennis courts in town. More information will be forthcoming. Um, there have been some concerns about amplified sound usage at Birch Meadow. It's getting louder than it has been previously. They're discussing how they'll approach that going forward. But in the meantime, they're just asking teams if they can turn the volume down a little bit. Um, they had received an inquiry as to the rubber mulch that is in some of the playgrounds in town. They have deferred to other boards, committees, and town staff on how to change or not that issue. Um, had numerous meetings for appointments to the Finance Committee. We appointed Ed Ross and Sean Jacobs for a three-year term and Andrew McLaughlin for our, the one-year term. For the Permanent Building Committee, uh, Kirk McCormick is joining and Mike Bean is returning. And on Bylaw Committee, we are very excited to have two wonderful candidates and Jesse Arnold was appointed. Do we need to go through uh, formal votes? No, those each have separate appointment committees consisting of the town manager and the chair of each of those uh, committees. So we're all set there. Town moderator. Town moderator. Town moderator. Who did I say? Town manager. Yes, thank you for that. So John, John and I met for the capital subcommittee. Um, we asked the town manager if he could add recreation projects to the capital plan. We had a general conversation on Simon's Way. We believe that we need a conservation study to determine how much of the land is usable. Um, we discussed some options for Oakland Road, the possibility to sell it, the possibility of veterans housing or other. Um, John suggested that we need um, a best use estimate. He said that's pretty standard, so Bob, I sort of okay. um, hand that over to you. Um, the idea of a downtown garage was brought up. Um, I know that one's been sort of controversial, but got thrown out there. Yep. Um, parking garage, yep. Um, however, we're in agreement that we need to hear from the schools on the early education space needs study, which will be presented to the school committee this week. We handled communications. So RMLD. RMLD had a great solar workshop. Um, that talked about the benefits of solar, the costs, um, how many other towns and in, in cities in the state of Massachusetts have it. Of 351 towns and cities in Massachusetts, 200 have solar installations on municipal buildings. Reading is currently not one of them. Um, the costs of panels have decreased about 2% year over year for the past five years. Residential panels pay for themselves in about six or seven years. Commercial installations pay for themselves in about eight years. Uh, right now, there are 35 residential solar installations in Reading, 121 in the other towns, and 17 commercial installations. None of those are in Reading. Um, uh, RMLD has made available several programs, so if you are a resident and interested in installing, installing solar, reach out to RMLD. They can help walk you through the process. Um, and they also have municipal, uh, three municipal options, which we can talk a little bit more on one of our later agenda items. Okay. And this, uh, they also have an informational packet, uh, RMLD, on okay. solar, which, okay. which... So you can ask for that as well. Yeah. Um, and then one of the other things that came up sort of more broadly from a liaison perspective is the potential need for open meeting law training for volunteers of boards, committees, and commissions. And um, a couple of ideas have gone thrown out there as far as, you know, having the state come out and having a formal training, but I think 
one of the options for getting it done efficiently <coughs> and with the most involvement is to have either us um, or uh, the town clerk or town council attend these as part of an agenda item of, on their one of their standard meetings to go through the basic do's and don'ts um, that will most likely affect them. So something we can consider as well. All right. There's, there's two, two quick questions. One, um, you brought up the, the mulch question. We have a, a letter in our packet about that as well. Is there a, a plan? Do we, do we have a, an action item that comes from that, or is that future agenda? Well, why don't we throw that? That can be lumped into eco-friendly. So right. let's, let's throw okay. it in there. And then one last comment, if I could. I missed one one thing. I met with the um, the project developers at the Sunoco site, um, the Majores, mm -hmm. Paul and Michael. Um, and they, uh, it was a very nice discussion. They seem to be very interested in making sure the project goes well. Um, they're also very interested in other potential projects in town. Um, but they basically said if there are any issues, please make sure they're aware of them and they'll deal with them. They do have a site manager who's there. Um, I, I had planned to meet with one and both of them came. It was great. So. Okay. Great. Andy? I just didn't totally follow the open meeting law um, endpoint. So, um, the town council and some others are going to go to training. And no. Then so the idea there is, you know, it's come up a few times that not all members, especially those that are new mm -hmm. or have experienced a lot of turnover, mm -hmm. have um, enough of an understanding of what the requirements are for open meeting law as it pertains to forums. Mm -hmm. So, and communication. So yeah. the idea is to have someone as yet unidentified um, to go and speak to them during one of their meetings. Oh, I so, see. I see. You know, it's, I, I mention it as part of liaison reports, but I don't want to go too deep down this path. Maybe we can add that to a future agenda. Yeah. Okay. To see how we want to handle it. Um, so if there's nothing else from the board, Bob, how are um, you? Thank you. Um, I attended a Weston and Sampson open house last week. Um, they're one of our newer businesses in town. It was really spectacular. They've uh, built out the space on Walkersbrook Drive quite well. They're a longtime vendor for us, for DPW especially, so they know our staff really well and uh, we got a nice tour. They're uh, going to be a very helpful neighbor. I also later that went to the Chamber of Commerce's 30th year celebration in Woburn at the Hilton and it wasn't quite the outdoor patio weather that they had hoped for, but I hadn't been since it had been renovated and it was really a nice space. So certainly congratulations. I saw a lot of people I hadn't seen in some time there. Um, the FinCom meeting tomorrow night's canceled, uh, despite Vanessa's hard work at uh, selecting new members. Uh, only two out of nine could make it tomorrow night. So, oh. so they are tentatively rescheduled for next <coughs> Monday where there is a quorum that may get moved if there's a bigger quorum on another day. Um, Austin Prep was uh, very helpful in a recent active shooter drill conducted last Monday and last Friday. I attended all day Monday. Other staff attended Friday. I'd like to thank uh, Headmaster Dr. Jim Hickey um, and his staff for being very hospitable. Uh, we both learned a lot, as we always do. Um, Maya actually attended Friday. I have a quick uh, memo I'm going to read from them, but one of the most impressive moments is when a helicopter came overhead and they said, well, did you call a Medifac? And the deputy chief said, well, certainly we did, which, which we hadn't. Um, so it was, it was very intense, but very educational. Um, I just wrote, I want to take a moment to thank you and your staff for allowing us to visit and observe the ASHA training last Friday. I thought it was tremendous and learned a great deal. I came away very impressed with all the detailed, involved communication and collaboration among all the Reading departments. Thanks again. Um, the reason they came out is they want to understand best practices because they're insurance. So you know, they want to spread that, spread that word as it were. Um, at your next meeting on July 9th when there's a full board, I'll go over in some detail the next police chief hiring process so the board is aware. Uh, Ann and John are the liaisons to public safety, so I've shared a little bit with them along the way. I'll uh, share a little bit more. Um, and I think one other thing um, that I'm not going to leave you with more of a question than a, than a solution, but the state came out with a CBD ruling last week. Um, For those watching at home, can you say what CBD is? Uh, it's a hemp derivative. It's in the, it's, it's magic dust. It's uh, whatever snake oil. It uh, makes everyone better. Um, it's in May food products. There's a couple shops in town that have opened, and without trying to misstate it too far, the state has banned it. Um, it's a it's a tricky situation in Reading because we already have 
an article planned for November town meeting and we've opened a public hearing process. So I just want to make sure, town council's been back and forth for the last week with me, but I want to make sure that the Board of Health is free from any interference that that might otherwise cause. If the board remembers when we were discussing marijuana, we opened a public hearing and that prevented marijuana from occurring until town meeting could decide. So I just want to make sure that the Board of Health is not constrained in any way, and I don't think they are, but I just have to make sure. Um, but this will be potentially a very contentious and big topic in town. Uh, as an example, North Reading just sent me an email yesterday where they banned it, and they've warned all their businesses they're going to enforce it. So it's it's one of those you know missives from the state without a lot of detail, as it were. Well, but Bob, if the state has banned it, state. I, I'm, uh, I'm being a little hmm. simple when I say that, okay. but there's certain there's a list. And they've banned it in food products, uh, and, and the, again, there's a list. Ah. Uh, and they have an approval and a disapproval list, and it's not crystal clear what that list is. So, so when you say the state, is this by regulation? DPH. DPH. Yeah. So we'll hear more about this. You will definitely hear more, but I just wanted to put that out there as a topic. I've been in communication for the last two days with the uh, Board of Health Chair and Board of Health staff. So, Bob, um, the, regarding the Board of Health, um, for the marijuana um, ban, I, the Board of Health didn't take a position at the time on that. Right. Um, we didn't do a, a ban. Um, that came out of town meet or an election. No, the, the, well, the, the initial ban came out of the fact we posted a hearing. And then the ban was affirmed by a vote of town meeting and the voters. Right. right. So we're now in that first step, and I yeah. don't think that applies to the Board of Health, but I just really want to make sure. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, and lastly, Vanessa had asked me to read a memo from uh, Chuck Tyrone, Conservation Administrator. This is about 1310 Main Street. Um, at the June 10th, 2019 Conservation Meeting, the Conservation Commission members discussed the Chapter 61 land located at 1310 Main Street. You remember that was in your packet a couple times a few months ago, or weeks ago. And, and its environmental assets. As this property abuts Main Street and is currently used for an overflow parking lot, dumpster storage area, and driveway access to the rear property. The Commission has no interest in this land and believe its continued commercial development will have no impact on the interest of the, the, interest of the Act and the Reading Wetland Protections Regulations. The Commission will support whatever decision the Select Board makes regarding this property and its Chapter 61 status. So now if you want to. So the question there is, um, we have this listed under Executive Session for Real Estate Interests. Um, we can choose to have the discussion publicly, um, or we can ask Bob more questions either publicly or in executive session. Um, there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of interest to purchase this land, is my understanding, um, as it doesn't have a lot of value for the town. So with that said, I want to hear from the board. We, we can vote on it now um, and um, choose not to move forward. I, do we have a motion, Bob? No, technically you don't have to vote. You could vote. Um, by taking no action, you've, you've stated your piece. There's a deadline coming up in the second week of August. Okay. So if the board does wish to pursue it, time is of the essence. Um, and if we choose not to pursue it, is there an interested buyer? Uh, there's already a buyer and a purchase and sale lined up. Okay. You are, uh, you are given as the town the right of first refusal. I think from a courtesy perspective, if we choose not to move forward with it, we should vote that we have no interest in this property okay. to allow the sale to move forward, whatever those terms are. Um, do we know if, if it was a unanimous um, view of the Conservation Commission? I don't know. I, I had heard from the administrator previously. I have some emails from him that indicated this was the thought on the commission. Okay. I don't know if they voted. Okay. I'm not sure there's a need for executive session discussion on it. I, I don't see the need. And, and after um, just purchasing uh, how many acres of land? 15. 15 plus. plus. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you're getting old. Uh, we can hear you still. Um, after having the, the, at the last town meeting um, had a lengthy discussion to purchase 
it was more than 15 acres. It's in two total. different pieces. Two, yeah. two <laughs> different pieces, but a lot of land. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it was not a unanimous um, th thought or, or town meeting was not unanimous on the issue. And uh, that land was a lot cheaper um, than, than this land. This is a, like 0.6 acres. So um, Here, I'll ask a different question. I don't want to go back to so, town meeting and propose this. So the, that, that conversation mm. at town meeting was about how it was really a unique opportunity. Mm. And I'm sensing that this, um, this other parcel is distinct from that and that it's not um, it's not right for us to, um, you know, build some other uh, property that could be could be utilized for the public good. Is so, Bob, is there the potential for this land to be of use to the town, given its um, any any land of the town could potentially be useful, but that location is not especially attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, closer to downtown would be. Um, just to be, even though it's not in this memo, to be clear, there are other parcels contiguous to this one that conservation would have interest in, from a, again, from a conservation standpoint. That's so this, not so this being more commercial land, the town has no immediate and obvious use for it. And it's a small parcel? I don't remember. Yeah, relatively. Point about point 0.6 acres. And what's it valued at? 400000 <laughs> As I said, it's, it's a little steep. It's not. It's, it's not something that you know. The, I'm trying to think of the things that um, right. the uses that were kicked around for the, yeah. the you know for that small. Of a we're plot. not going to build an early childhood yeah. center there. We're None not going to build things. a senior center there. Right. It's not of use for conservation purposes. Right. I'm going to have a hard time justifying that cost for that small parcel that far from the downtown. That's what I was. Trying to say. It's sort of fine. Um, so, do we want to vote? Are we comfortable voting that we do not want to take action on this? So that there's an official statement from the board. Excuse me, Vanessa. Question? Of course. Um, it's unusual for the board to be taking action for public comment. This wasn't on the agenda in this order. Mm -hmm. So, would you just, you know, ask? I don't know if anyone's here. Uh, do you have any comment on that before you vote? That's fair. Uh, is there any comment from the public on the purchase of this land? <laughs> Mary Ellen O'Neill. Um, I did see the packet, I know, which this is the uh, Reading Animal Clinic property, but this is listed as 310, and I think that's listed as 312. So when I looked it up, I was just confused because I thought it did involve some of that wetland that's right there along the main street. So but I want to clarify that just the commercial portion of that property that is uh, under that 40, uh, under that 60, chapter 61 designation? Um, uh, the Reading, uh, the veterinarian is proposed as the buyer, but they do not own it now. Okay. Uh, they are looking to add on to their parcel, if you will. So perhaps you looked at their parcel and the adjacent <coughs> parcel with the numbers, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, all I can say is they have a use for it, so it's not all wetlands, and conservation doesn't have a use, so it's not very much wetlands. Any other public comment on the topic? Um, given that we are taking this out of order, why don't we push the vote to the 9.55 before we go into executive session, just in case anyone does pop up later. All right. Um, Bob, I think we waylaid your... About tree hearing? No. Uh, I'm, well, the, you know, I'm done. Open is there any other public comment on any other topic? Yeah. So um, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, provide your name and address. Um, please keep comments to topics under the purview of this board, and please no derogatory or campaign-related comments. Bill? My name is Jack Dever. I live at 38 Tamarack Road. I was a neighbor of mine and sent orders at a board concerning the gas main problem we had a year ago, and I don't know if you're going to discuss that tonight or we need to get resolution for it. Next week, is it? Bob? Um, you should see them out there within a week. Within a week? Yeah. That's Let me know. Oh, well, you know what? Well, it's <laughs> so yeah. I'm giving them a room around the holiday, but they should be there. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Thank you, Vanessa. Bill Brown, 28 Mountain Road. Uh, there was an instructional motion given by Town Meeting as to the use or misuse, if you will, of Memorial Park. 
the report was not forthcoming to town meeting. Um, I think it should be. Uh, my suggestion, quite frankly, I think it's time perhaps to have the Attorney General's office come out and review the whole thing and once and for all put it to bed what the use of that part can be. Because I think we're just going to keep kicking the can down the road and you're going to get a lot of people that want to use it, no, yes. And I think a final decision should be made. <coughs> one way or the other. And I personally <coughs> don't have a trouble with if the Attorney General says baseball can be played there, fine, I don't care. But I think we should have a final concern, uh, destination for that part. Um, and uh, I, I, that's, what my, that's my own concern. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else? All right. Uh, so now we will move on to the public hearing for the tree removal request at Winthrop Ave. Bob, do we have... <coughs> We need to do anything to open. Uh, <coughs> we can have the. Do we have the hearing notice? I have so the hearing notice. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. You Thank you. Um, do we want to have the presentation for it? Let's go ahead. Uh, to the inhabitants of the Town of Reading, please take notice that the Select Board of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on June 25th, 2019, at 7. 35 p.m. <laughs> in the select board meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on a request from the property owner to remove a tree at 119 Winthrop Avenue. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the town manager's office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday, 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and will be in the select board packet on the and on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on June 25th, 2019 to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us. Okay. We'll hand it over. Okay, um, this is Mike Hannaford, um, tree warden, DPW. Um, the packet had pretty comprehensive background on this. It had both sides, if you will. It had Mike's views as the tree warden and the request certainly from the applicant. Is the applicant present? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so really at this point, I, I think both the applicant and Mike are here to ask questions. You might want to hear from the applicant first. Okay. Um, so I brought some pictures as well. I can, I can ask you just to identify yourself, so yeah. Sure, Jay Gallagher and... Marjorie Gallagher. Thank you. So, own the house at 119 Thanks. So basically our concern is right at the end of the house, and I'll pass around these pictures so that all of you do. There's a very large pine tree. Um, it's really not a residential tree. It's much more of a forest tree. Um, it's probably over 100 feet tall. I believe you said my good measure is what, 33 inches? 34 inches. Yep. <clears throat> so it's a significant size. It also drops some very significant branches. So our biggest concern is we have a two-year-old son at home. In the windstorm that we had, I think it was in February, lots of very large limbs came home, came on while he was home, um, very close to the house, very close to the cars, very close to the driveway. The two biggest limbs measuring that, I think you said eight feet long, five inches of diameter. So obviously that would be fatal if that hits the um, So our biggest concern is obviously for our safety and the safety of our son. If that tree comes down, it's going to come down one house. It's, you know, it's too big to fall anywhere else. Um, it's too big to really not have major damage to the home. <coughs> It's destroying the driveway, it's destroying the retaining wall. Um, the town's been out at least twice to prune it, and it continues to drop branches continuously. The branches that fell were live wood as well. So even if the town comes out periodically to prune it, it's still going to be dropping very significant large branches. This area is prone to windstorms. We're going to have more windstorms. The wind's going to get worse. More branches are going to come down. You know, and it's really a safety risk for us, for our neighbors, as well as a property risk. Um, and it is destroying the public sidewalk. Yes, well. And so it will cut, it is causing a traffic hazard down at the end of the street. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a small question on this photo, which end is up? I, I saw the one that so, shows an impaled stick. Right, so that's another yeah. So that yeah. followed February when the ground was frozen. Uh -huh. um, and that stick was sticking into the ground about an inch and a half out of the, out of the soil. Okay, in when? Uh, February. When was. the ground was frozen? Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Mike, we'll hand it over to you. 
Um, so the first time I got a um, call on this was in October. Um, I think it was in November of 2017 after a windstorm uh, at the end of October of 2017 um, about some, some branches that had broken off. Uh, we'd gone out there and trimmed the tree um, as requested. Um, we trimmed all the dead wood and we trimmed up the, um, some growth going towards the house and over the utility wire. Um, in February of 2000, uh, 2019, I received a phone call from Mr. Gallagher stating that after a recent windstorm that we had, um, we had some tree branches that had fallen. Um, it, was, it was no more than five inches in diameter and eight feet in length. Um, the branches were picked up, the tree was trimmed before, um, after the, the storm, um, which did uh, visual inspections. Um, I'd gone out there and used a resistor graph to drill the tree um, to make sure that the tree was sound. Um, we've, myself and um, the, the crew has actually gone out there and done visual inspections from the ground in from the air. In this year, I had um, RMLD, they um, send out sort of a, a monthly um, list of where they're going to be trimming trees in town so that I can be aware of this town trees that may be involved. Um, and from the arborist that sent it out, there was nothing that identified um, for that pine tree that they had concerns of it themselves. Um, and then a few days later, um, on March 15, 2019, um, I received a daily email from Mayor Tree about going out and trimming the uh, Winthrop Ave, and the pine tree was actually not trimmed, so they actually they skipped over that tree. Um, we do a yearly windshield report and survey. Windshield survey is we drive during the winter time, we send crews out and drive every street in town to visually see um, any uh, cavities, any dead wood, any hangers um, that are in the tree. And we make um, you know, a list. Usually it's about 150 hangers that are out there. Depends on you know, what type of storms we have uh, prior. And um, I believe in 2014, I had a um, broken limb that was in um, that pine tree uh, that was identified during the survey, and we removed it. I have not had any other um, times that I, I went back and, and looked. Um, going around each year um, and looking back at my, my trim list, in removal lists, um, we, we do go up down these streets an awful lot and um, I actually didn't have any other um, trims before 2017 that were, were logged in. Um, Winter Bab has definitely been um, pruned heavily and removed trees. Uh, a lot of species of Norway maples that are um, kind of hitting their, their lifespans and um, we're removing uh, some of them, and, and we, we trim back each year some of them because they, they die off, but I had no records of um, anything before that, 2017. Um, I did enclose you know, the emails in the packet uh, from um, Mayor Tree, the two, the two different emails. I enclosed the uh, precision weather forecasting that we did have. Um, its precision is the, what the, the public works uses for um, our weather for just get sent to the garage twice a day and uh, we did have um, 55 to 65 mile an hour uh, projected winds um, so pine trees they do they do break off especially on heavy snow loads um, and um, you know you will have live live branches that break off um, most of our calls that we get during storms are um, Norway maples um, and a lot of dead wood in um, other trees and 
you know, elm trees and ash trees that fall apart. Um, we do get pine trees, but most of our calls are no way maintenance. Good. Bob, any other comment from the town? Uh, no, just that um, you've had different requests from the public before, and, and DPW has certain policies and rules, and they can go up so far, and then the public's right is to appeal to you, and that's the situation we're in. Okay. This is a little different than sometimes for a driveway opening, for instance. The town doesn't have the legal authority to grant it, but doesn't oppose it. But in this case, Mike is saying, in his best judgment, this tree does not have to come down. Now, that's a really tricky situation because trees fall, branches fall. So none of us can be sure what's going to happen to this tree. He's just used his judgment, you know, the trees around the town, that this tree's in reasonably good shape. And yet it has had some branches fall. So it's now up to you to make the harder call. Okay. So before um, we have board discussion, is there any other public comment? Okay. I'm Marie Thomas Howell. I reside at 120 Winthrop Ave, so I'm directly across the street from that tree. I've expressed concerns maybe three years ago, I called and, and expressed my concerns of that tree coming. If it falls, it's going to take down a quarter of my house. But at that time, they assured me the tree was a healthy tree and that they would um, come down and trim it and not to be concerned. So I said, okay, and I let it go. In the, a couple of years ago, these kids bought the house, and they are kids to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, Enjoy uh, it. <laughs> you know, they expressed their concern. They put a lot of money into that house when they bought it. They want to put in a driveway. They have to keep their cars in the driveway because there's no garage on their premise. It's not the health of that tree. It's the branches coming down. Potentially that tree, I don't know if it would ever fall, but it is causing, it could cause some um, very disturbing effects with the tree, with the branches falling. They got a three-year-old baby out there that plays in the swing set in the backyard. And I'm very, very concerned of that baby and the cars out there, the driveway, they can't even put a driveway in. They put so much money into that house because the boots are lifting everything up. The um, hot shop people have told them they won't attach that with that tree with those roots there. So their hands are tied and they have to live in that condition. I don't think it's fair. Thank you. I also have a comment. I live next door to me. My name is Jane Cooley. Thank you. And years ago, the tech of one of our neighbors put his house in below grade. So in order to, uh, the town voted to have <coughs> the street made below grade, which made our, our residents and John's residents have to have walls put in. Well, when they put the walls in, they didn't put any drains in. So consequently, Mr. Zaya and ourselves had to replace the walls at our own expense. Now, if that tree comes down, I want it on record that this is a hazard that I want it on the town record. Because if that tree comes down, it's going to take out my wall and part of my bedroom. And I want it on record that the town knows that this is a hazard and I am not paying to put up another wall. Thank you. Sir? Paul Murphy Ashtree, first lady to talk is my girlfriend. <laughs> so I'm in her house a lot. <coughs> and I watched that in the windstones. Uh, the tree wad and can tell you, maples and so forth, elms, ash, they have tap roots that go deep. Pines don't. They have lateral roots that spread out. And if you've seen houses, houses in the yards, you can see when the pines go, the whole root base comes up. And you can squeeze it with your hand. It's only this thick because there's rock underneath. It's an accident waiting to happen. It will cleave Marie's house in half, and it will take these kids' house and split it down the middle to them. There's no need in the town of Reading. We own a town of forest. Go up there and take a walk. But you don't need this tree in this neighborhood. It's a hazard. And I'm back at Gene up. They should see a lawyer immediately if action is taken. They shouldn't have to use their own insurance. They should sue the town. Thank you. Any other public comment? Um, Barry Ellen O'Neill, 125 Summer Avenue. Um, this is a very tricky situation. I do want to say that the, and it is difficult with these pines in the neighborhoods, I recognize that. 
I also do want to say that the tree itself is healthy and has gates of life ahead of it. I don't think the fear is that it will fall down. It's more that the branches are, you know, can be disruptive and of concern. Although I do love a walk in the forest and I don't go up there when the, when the pines are swaying and branches are falling because it's not safe. So that is a reality. I am also concerned that as the weather deteriorates that we are becoming fearful of everything and our, our response is to get rid of whatever it is could possibly you know disturb us but there's more than us to be concerned about so I do want to take a larger view of this I understand this is a very unique situation it's impacting their sense of safety it's impacting the driveway and other people's sense of safety but we have to take the longer look, and maybe we can address it in other areas. Um, so I do want to advocate on behalf of the tree, and I also want to think larger and further out about the issues that we're facing and how we're going to look at this, so that we aren't so afraid, and we're not banning all, you know, we get rid of all the animals that bother us, the trees that bother us. There will only be us at some point, and we can't like that. So um, I know it's a tricky situation. I can't, you know. I would like to see the tree survive. Um, I understand the neighbor's concerns. Um, whether there's some assurance that the town takes responsibility, it's checked more frequently, um, or in anticipation of large storm is looked at more frequently. I don't know if there's any you know, compromise here, but if there is, then I would appreciate that. Thank you. Just one little thing. Uh, this lady goes all over town sticking her nose into other people. Sir, that, we, that kind of a comment is inappropriate. This, this please, tree has sir, the please sidewalks. keep your. That's fine. movement, the tree has cracked the hot tub. You can see that. Take a ride up and look at it. The cracks fill back in again with sand and debris. But this has no place on the street. The residence is that close. Thank you, sir. I know. Sir, the gentleman in the back. Mike, Michael Ashy, I live at 113, went for a lived there for 31 and a half years, lived next door to the Gallicans. <clears throat> so I've seen that tree for 31 and a half years and I've seen the limbs down and the tree get trimmed and whatever. <clears throat> but I also saw the limbs that came down in February next door and saw that the path that the Gallicans usually travel in the morning, afternoon, and evening themselves and with the child is where those limbs came down and it would have caused death to, to one of these at the time. Okay. I'd rather see a life live than a tree stay up. Thank you, sir. And this is to say to follow up to those comments at the town of Windsor and all. You know, you have an option not to go in the town of Windsor and Windsor. You don't have the option not to be in your home in Windsor, not to go to your car, not to take your set of daycare. You know, trees are important, but two-year-olds are more important. Thank you. Any other public comment from someone we haven't heard of? Um, so I'll open the discussion now for the board. Um, I, I have one question just to kick us off. Um, Mike, the, the tree's healthy, so I'm, I'm glad that was identified. My question is, we've heard from the neighbors, we've seen the photos of the size of the branches. I know that we've had down branches all over town when we have these big windstorms. Mm -hmm. Is the tree as it stands now, aside from the fact that you and the town does not have the capacity to take the tree down, even if you wanted to, right? Because it's healthy. We, we normally don't take down live trees. trees right? Correct, yep. But in your opinion, is this tree a safety risk? Every tree is a hazard. It's just what level of hazard it is. <coughs> um, I wouldn't want this tree in front of my house. I guess it's just to follow up on that, I noticed um, in your report you said that your number one priority is always public safety, um, and you're confident in your decision that this tree is healthy, but not not you you didn't go beyond that to say you're confident that it is safe because you know you're is it fair to say that you're not confident that it's safe? It we we could have a microburst that comes through and mm -hmm. you could have 70 mile an hour winds that go right down with the bab. It's a tunnel, there's no trees down there at all at the mm -hmm. end. And it, it could it could wipe out the tree. Um, but as the tree stands right now, the tree is the tree is healthy. We don't remove healthy trees. Mm -hmm. um, I have 
you know, daily I drive around town and I look at trees and I have decisions to make of sure. how can I save this tree? What, mm -hmm. what liability does it have? What's around it? Mm -hmm. How heavily is the street traveled? Even in the cemeteries. And it, it, it kills me in the cemeteries to take down these trees. But mm -hmm. uh, there's people in there visiting. I see splits. I see, you know, cavities in these trees. Um, I, I've instructed to the, the employees that I have, if we're going in to go and remove a tree, to, to take a picture of why we're removing it, because I get questioned a lot of the time, why did you remove this healthy tree? And we don't. It's, there's a split in over this um, you know, cavity, but this tree, in my opinion, is healthy. But anything can happen um, in a tree that's 100 feet tall <coughs> in the whole situation of, of everything. Um, you know, that, that definitely could, because there's no trees down there to block it, pine trees. In the woods, they do protect themselves um, from, from the sway, and it's why you don't see a lot of damage to pine trees. But when they start clearing out pine trees, and there's pine trees that are, you know, left two or three that never were, you know, catching the wind like they do, they, they will go and break off or uproot or Top, usually the tops break off. Usually they don't necessarily uproot all the time. Andy, Mark, do you have questions or comments? Uh, Mike, is it a, a big tree for a residential area? Um, we have large trees, but we normally have um, maples and oaks that are like that. Um, in that particular area, it is a large tree. Um, if I want another quick question, uh, we say it's a it's a town tree. Um, do we know kind of its, its history when it was planted? Was it part of a planting program? And what would happen if if it was decided to take it out? Would that would a new tree go in its place, or what would happen? If if we remove this tree, um, you know, I I would want to go and plant trees down Winthrop Ave. Mm -hmm. um, this step it's definitely an area that should be planted. Mm -hmm. um, because every every street in town should have shade trees on it. Um, that area, it, we would have to go and see if we could plant a tree back in. in um, I, I try not to plant trees near driveways now. Um, that tree, there would be no record doing um, the International Society of Aquaculture's um, math out to what the age of the tree is. Um, being in the urban environment, being near the street, it it's probably about you know between 140 and 165 years old. So it's a lot older than the neighborhood. It was there first. It was there first, and we have a lot of these trees in town that were there first. Um, you know, we, we have people that they move to town and say, I, I can't see back and on my driveway, and, and they have a 40, 50 inch oak tree, and like, well, this just tree's been here for a long time. You know, people build homes around trees like that. So, one last question, if I could. Okay. Sorry, Andy. Um, there was a question about looking at it more regularly. Would that, in your opinion, alleviate some of the concerns? Um, yeah, there's there's a list of trees that I look at regularly. Um, you know, because a lot of a lot of homeowners have concerns, and I, I assure them. I say, give me a call if it's. You know, if after a windstorm, if you see something, you hear something, um, and then I go out there. If it's every six months, every six months or quarterly, just to go and do inspections of these trees, um, because Winthrop Ave, that section, it's the dead end section. It's not a heavily traveled area for me. Um, it's not like you know driving down Rose Street down towards the compost or Franklin Street. You know, I see these trees all the time. If I see something change in those, it's a it's a different story. So, um, you know, looking at the Google Maps for that tree and then what we've trimmed um, the tree the tree looks pretty pretty close to um, you know what it was in 2013 um, except for the trees the branches that were trimmed over the utility wires a little bit towards the house so this tree's been on your watch list mm -hmm. for several years now it, it, no it hasn't it, oh. it, it, it was I just went back on Google Maps and, and printed out the, the picture just to compare it for the picture that I took recently 
Uh, it just, from looking at the, at the documentation, it looks like um, Mr. Gallagher first made the request in 2017 for it to be trimmed. Correct. So it's been sort of maintained since then? We trimmed it in 2017, okay. and I have not been back there since, uh, except for 2019, to, to pick up the branches that fell and trim it after. <coughs> when were these taken? Um, that was in February after the wind storm. Thank you. Andy, did you help me? Yeah. Um, first, I, I want to make it clear that um, I, I hear um, the concern about <clears throat> valuing trees around town and, um, and, and, and not being totally fearful of, of every tree. Um, and and I, uh, if this tree does come down, um, I'd like to see the other other trees go up, um, as, as you suggested, so that we keep reading uh, green. Um, th so I, I want to make that that really clear. That said, your comment about I, I found your comment about um, would you want this tree in front of your house? Um, uh, really um, insightful. These tree, these pine trees, they become, um, to use a term my kids use, it, ginormous. I mean, they really get tall. And so, if a branch break breaks off up top, it's got uh, quite a amount of energy packed into it when it lands. Um, and it's it's very it's very close to that the, the house. Um, So, so with that said, my questions, I guess, would be: um, You said if this tree was to um, have some sort of severe incident, it would likely break off more at the top or upward. Up. A lot of the times, when we have pine trees during storms, they they normally break off at the top, the top section. If it's the top third, they end up snapping off because of wind. Um, if there was issues of um, insect damage or there was a cavity in there that we missed, I mean, it could be at any point, you know, if it's halfway down or at the base of it. And the, the likelihood of it uh, uprooting, is that, um, is there a greater chance of it uprooting because uh, it's, it's um, growing under a driveway and how much purchase do the roots have? Um, is there legend there? Or? Well, that's the point. You don't know exactly what is being, you know, if there is ledge. But um, most urban trees um, that are out at the edge of the road, their root system are not like it would be uh, for, say, in, in someone's backyard or on the forest right. or something like that. Right. All right. Thank you. Th and, and thanks for the information. And, and thanks to everyone who spoke. Um. So one one of the residents asked whether there was to, if there could be any kind of compromise. Mike, would you recommend? Uh, I, I noticed in your report you said if the select board allows the tree to be taken down, I would ask that they require all costs for removal of the tree, including stump grinding and restitution for the tree. All funds would be donated to the tree planting fund for future plantings on Winthrop Ave. Would you say that's the best compromise type of situation you'd recommend? I would. And when you say, uh, are you asking that the residents bear the costs? Is that what? Because the tree is healthy, there? correct? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Have we had previous incidences where this board has agreed to take down a healthy tree in recent memory? In Forest Street, about three years ago. Do you remember that? How many years ago? About oh, three years ago, one on Forest Street. The only one that I can remember was when Bob Keating was still here. Yeah. It, there was one on Forest Street. Yeah. Um, the home that was a perfect example. They wanted to get the tree down because they couldn't see around the driveway, yeah. and they claimed that the tree was rotted. Well, that was like ten years ago. Yeah, and so. it was it was a number of years ago, and um, that, that's why we're not talking boring. He bought the resistor graph after that so that we could go and look inside the tree and see if it was it was solid. Given how far back that was, um, do you recall or if 
the resident well did, so the tree did come down right the tree did come down yeah. did the, the town were requested to make a contribution i couldn't say whether they did they never did okay, okay. that's what that I was, was one of keating's last words of walking out the door here <laughs> they never gave the money <laughs> okay um all right could i speak to the money please for one second in reviewing the state statutes that Mike had sent me, there's no language in there about the homeowner being responsible for cost or anything like that. The only language around cost at all is that if the tree causes damage to your property, the town is liable to pay for the, the damages to property. And in reviewing the statutes, there's no compensatory, you know, to trees or the cost of taking it down or anything along those lines. If it's town property that's damaging your property, you know, realistically, that should be a town responsibility. Right. Thank you. Um, all right, so at this point, we've heard from the public, we've heard from the staff. I think it might be the best as a board. We've asked all our questions if we I want to have a. One more very quick question Go ahead. regarding costs. We're all in a yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> regarding costs, ha roughly how much would it be to take down a tree like this? Um, $2,500, give or take. Okay, thanks. That's with, with some grinding and removal of everything, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so why don't we as a board have a discussion about what our feelings on this are, if anybody wants to kick us off? Um, so this is a hard one. I, mean, I think that, in my opinion, the safety question is a big one, uh, but I would love to see a way to preserve you know, trees on Winthrop or add more trees to Winthrop mm -hmm. and figure out if that's the right the right solution here. Um, I, I hate taking down healthy trees, but it's, it's not in a great location, and, and a lot of things have changed since since that. I'm, I'm wondering if if we would put the same kind of tree there again if we were planting it now. Uh, the answer to that is no. Thoughts? Um, yeah. I did like you, Andy. Find it persuasive when um, Mike said that. He would not want that tree in front of his house and i um you know but before coming today i wasn't quite sure um what the you know where that evidence would lead because you know i'm reading that it's a healthy tree but it certainly seems from the photos that we that we've seen and the testimony we've heard um that it does present that it has presented and would continue in the future to present um, a risk to the safety of residents and property, but more importantly, residents. Yeah, do you have thoughts? Um, yeah, um, a couple. Uh, one is that um, people, you know, taking walks out in the wood, woods will die from, on occasion, from a tree. It's called the widow maker, you know, hanging. We had a situation in the forest. Yeah. Not a death, but a Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so it, it does happen, and, and I'm not proposing, therefore, we cut down all the trees in the town no. forest, um, but this is a very big tree next to, very close to someone's house, and my guess is when they built the tree, uh, the house, rather, um, that tree didn't look like anything like it does now. Um, personally, I have concerns about having these really large pine trees along the street. Um, now, I'm not saying go cut them all down, but um, maybe we could repopulate that street with, maybe the board could have a discussion um, together with you about repopulating that street with some trees that are more appropriate for uh, the neighborhood, but could add some. When I plant trees now, I I do varieties of trees. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were planted before, it was just usually one species down the road. Um, there's been a couple areas that we've actually had to remove um, almost the whole street because they were all rotted or diseased or dying back, and they were all one species all hitting their expiration date. And that's that's what's happening a lot now. And people look at me and they don't understand why we keep trimming and trimming and at the same time we're planting other trees as we're trimming um, but as soon as we get to that point that you can't trim anymore and there's a safety concern we do remove the trees so I, I would go and plant um, a, a variety of trees um, 
appropriate trees. If, if one side of the road has utility wires, you know, we plant flowering trees, and then the other side, if, if there's no utilities, we look at planting shade trees where, you know, maybe if it's 50, 60 feet, and they have a nice spread to them, and it, it's just appropriate for this tree, and salt tolerant. Um, so I know we've danced around this a little bit. I think the tree should come down. I, I hesitate to cut down healthy trees, but I, I wouldn't want these branches coming down around my house, frankly. Um, as far as the who incurs the cost, um, respectfully, I mean, I, I think it's on, it, technically it's the town responsibility, and I am hard pressed to ask a resident to cover the cost of something that the town maintains and technically owns. Um, I would love to see, you know, if this particular strip of road doesn't have a lot of trees, I'd love to see more trees being planted. If there's a funding issue, Bob, maybe that's something we can talk more about. Um, so that's, I'm not going to mince words. I think the tree needs to. I can't disagree with, with any, anything you said. So, um, Mark, can I ask you to close the hearing? Move to close the hearing regarding the tree removal request at 119 Winthrop Avenue. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Great. Um, are we ready to move on the... So, I want to be clear on what we're voting for here. Um, so, the motion reads, move that the board approve the tree removal request at 119 Winthrop Street. Bob, please correct me if I'm wrong. If we approve this request, we are granting the town the authority to remove this tree. Correct. Okay. So, Mark, could I ask you to read the And responsibility. The authority and the responsibility. Oh, yeah. Move that the board approve the tree removal request at 119 Winthrop Avenue as presented. Second. Second. All those in favor? Great. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much for all the work. All right. Um, why don't we take a five minute break before we move on to the Birch Meadows survey results? Oh, shit.
Thanks, everyone. Uh, next up on our agenda is a new pol uh, police officer badge pinning. So, Bob, I'll hand it off to you or Deputy Chief. Thank you. And, and in they come. Oh, God. Please. Deputy. 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 I just want to, uh, again, thank the uh, select board for taking time out of your busy schedule to have us here. As you know, in the um, past, these badge pinnings are very important for us. It's a way for us to recognize the officers, not only introduce the officers to the select board, but to the town, people that are here to see, and talk a little bit about them and let them know who's actually patrolling the streets for us. And I want to thank the uh, members of the police department that came tonight. And I'd like to thank Chief Burns and Assistant Chief Jackson for coming out and supporting us as well. It's yeah. public safety, as you know, we always kind of, um, oh. And there's more fire. More fire, fire, sorry. They had to run off for a call, so they're back, so. Um, <laughs> but uh, we do appreciate the fire department coming down, as you know. Um, public safety, we support each other. We are there for each other. We're the ones out there in the street. And it's a, kind of great to have you guys here supporting us um, as we support each other daily out there. So I just want to thank them for being here for, as well. So, first officer we have is Officer Joshua Griffith. Um, officer Griffith graduated uh, Mass Economic Regional High School in 2013. Mm -hmm. He graduated from uh, Western New England University in 2017 with a degree in criminal justice. And we actually hired him in July of last year and we picked him up. He's actually already at the Lowell Police Academy. Uh, he got, was there in May. He was awarded the Sean Collier Scholarship in honor of uh, the MIT officer was killed and they put a scholarship out every year. It's very competitive. It's awarded to a person that gets to go for the academy and get sponsored through. So we actually picked him up in July in the academy already. We were working at MIT to coordinate his transition over to the Redding Police Department. Um, he wasn't hired by them, but he won the scholarship and was being sponsored to go through the academy. So we actually picked him up about halfway through the academy. And uh, it's been a big take up for us. And like so we had in July, he's completed his field training. He's on the road serving us. And when he's not writing police officer, Joshua Griffith, he's also a second lieutenant, Josh Griffith, from the uh, Massachusetts National Guard. He's with the 9, 972nd Military Police Company. So he brings a uh, world of experience with him, too, and we're very happy to um, have him here with us tonight. And uh, he's being pinned by his father, John. I got present arms. and he graduated from Southern New Hampshire University in 2016 with a degree in criminal justice. He was hired by us in September 2018 and attended the uh, Transit Police Academy in Quincy and he graduated March 20th. He's just completed his field training a few weeks ago and is now out on his own serving the streets of Reading. So I would like to uh, thank him again for being here tonight and for being a member of the Reading Police Department. He's being pinned by his mother, Cheryl. I got present arms. Congratulations, welcome. Congratulations. Welcome back. Congratulations. 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 And again, I'd just like to thank the board and let you know, um, just quick, quick background. Years ago when I got hired, we rotated badge numbers around. We had ID numbers, badge numbers, cruiser numbers. We went by about a thousand different numbers. In 2000, under Chief Marchand, we switched to 
permanent badge numbers that move up the ranks with you. And we also went to a gender neutral term back in 2000, we went from patrolman to patrol officer. And two um, of the first of the 100 series. Oh, the badge wow. numbers we've seen here. So it's the uh, first time we've actually had the three digits um, on the badges. So it's the uh, first since we've hired. So we started that in 2000, Chief Marsh Andrews, badge number one. And we've moved up since, so we have the first of the 100 series. Nice. Very so, cool. And um, again, I just wanted to uh, congratulate both of them. Um, we're very happy to have them. They're, they're very active out in the public. Um, they get the community for police and philosophy that we have about serving the community, being giving back to the community, and we're going to be inspirational big help to us. And um, I just wanted to thank you for your time, uh, for letting us come and introduce them. And thank you again, Fire Department, Police Department, for coming out for us. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you, Deputy Chief Clark, and everyone who's here this evening. Um, to our two newest officers, thank you very much. Our community is very happy to have you, um, and thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Picture? Oh, sure. Picture. You're in the back. scene. I know they're great, but I do I do feel like. All right. So uh, next on the agenda, we have the results from the Birch Meadow survey, um, and we have uh, both recreation staff and uh, committee members here with us. So, John, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Well, the subcommittee asked me to come in tonight, and obviously I was here to support them, and I'm more than happy to introduce them. Um, the volunteer boards that I've been a part of, especially this past year, have been extremely supportive. Um, they're very passionate about recreation, about the initiatives that we have moving forward, and work very hard. Um, and I don't get the opportunity to publicly thank them enough. So I would like to do that. So the subcommittee, who um, two of the members of the subcommittee have been involved in the subcommittee for over 10 years, 10 years, 12 years. Um, so Rich and Mary Ellen have been involved for several years. Um, and I just can't say enough good things about how passionate everybody is on the volunteer boards. And most recently the past year, having liaisons that have been involved heavily as well, attending the recreation committee meetings and the subcommittee meetings, we really appreciate it. I know it's been some time since the recreation division has been in in any capacity, so we appreciate the fact that the select board um, wanted us to come in and just show you and show the public what we've been working on behind the scenes and most specifically our amazing volunteer boards. So, Jenna, before you jump in, yeah. um, do you, does the recruit committee have a quorum? So the subcommittee does. So you um, just want to call yourselves to order? Yeah. Um, I'd like to call the subcommittee uh, to order. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Jenna, do you want to just introduce who, who you are? I'm not well, sure. Excellent. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'm the Recreation Administrator. I'm Jenna Fiorenti. This is Richard Hand. Um, I'm Mike Coltman. 
Mary Ellen Killian. Um, and just a little background about the first Birch Meadow Master Plan. Um, the subcommittee has been meeting for about a year. Um, most recently, we decided in the fall to release a survey to the community to get the pulse of the community, what the community was looking for, and um, it seems that the survey results that were released in 2007 and 2015 and the most recent survey that we took do have consistent results, which is pretty interesting. Seems like the community um, does know what they want and the subcommittee will present exactly what the survey results um, showed and we're looking forward to getting your feedback and seeing what you have in store for us in the future, hoping to move some of these initiatives forward. So, Rich, right. you want to start off? Sure, okay. Uh, before I begin, I'm going to introduce a great president oh. of the Recreation <laughs> Committee. Chair. 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 <laughs> president. I just elevated up. <laughs> 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 Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. There's a family right there. <laughs> um, thanks, Jenna, for the introduction, the kind words. Um, Thank you guys for the opportunity. Andy, I want to personally thank you. Vanessa, I know you guys helped us craft this. Um, we need your support and guidance, so that was very helpful. We need to also thank these two individuals here um, for their hard work and energy in Jenna. You know, awesome working with you. You keep us, you keep us all together <laughs> in line, everything like that. So I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank you for, for all your, your hard work and effort to uh, keep us not only for this committee, but the whole committee as well. So thank, thank you. you as well for everything you do. Um, so again, here to kind of talk about um, the Birch and Metal Master Plan. And before I begin, you know, you know, the organizations with towns, you start off with the emission statement, right? This is the guiding principle, helps us with all the decisions we want to make with the committee. So we've developed this um, mission statement. So let me read it to you, um, see what you think. Uh, the Birch Metal Master Plan Subcommittee works to create a community-based recreation and open space uh, for the Birch Metal uh, footprint. Very simple, um, but to the point. And you know, really helps, again, helps us from a decision-making standpoint. Next, you know, as we kid about this, you know, I've been in this committee 12 years. Unbelievable. It's really hard to think about the, you know, the subcommittee, you know, the Birch Metal Master Plan. So just to take us back in time a little bit, in uh, 2007, the uh, Board of Selectmen um, started this subcommittee to um, say, what, what's the master plan for Birch Metal? And they put dollars aside for capital investment. Um, so the committee formed a, a team together, conduct some surveys, get some input from the community, and come up with a plan. So again, 12 years ago, um, it's been revisited many times and, and reviewed many times because of situations within the, within the community. Uh, so last year, the Recreation Committee decided to um, start it up again. And that's what we are today, again, as a, as a committee and with your help as well, to formulate this master plan you know, for our community because you know, this is our land and we want to hear everyone's input in terms of what this should be in, in the future. Next, when you think about you know the Birch Meadow uh, footprint, most of us think about you know the high school, the athletic fields, uh, down there the tennis courts, um, but it's more than that. It's the you know Coolidge um, field in the back. It's Higgins uh, conservation area here across Birch Meadow Drive. So when you think about this footprint, it encompasses a lot of acres, and we were trying to figure out how many. I don't know if anybody knows. I don't know if do you know, Bob, do you know how many acres? It's, it's a lot of, it's a big footprint when you, when you think about this. And when you think about Birch Meadow, again, don't, don't think about it as the football field, baseball field, across the street, Higgins, beautiful conservation over there, and behind the uh, Coolidge Middle School as well. So this is, this is our... In the Birch Meadow School. In the Bir Birch Meadow School also. Birch Meadow School? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, Higgins, the Higgins Conservation Higgins Area. Conservation. First metal is down in Richmond. Yeah, but yeah, we're not, our, our land we're looking at is the Coolidge. I know where you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. So this is the area we're looking at. Um, so again, you know, um, you know, what are our goals? So again, if uh, four goals, a lot of debate about this. You know, what are our goals? And again, 
just to help us figure out what do we want this land to look like? How do we want community to, to be involved? So here are the four ones that we came up with. First of all, develop high quality area for active and passive recreation um, while protecting and enhancing the natural environment. This is a beautiful area. And we want to keep it beautiful you know, for many generations to come. Um, evaluate and plan for recreational trends and changing demographics. This is an interesting one because think about 12 years ago, I'm gonna kid with Mike on this for a second, pickleball wasn't even on our radar screen, right? <laughs> It's not a pickleball, right? <laughs> you know, and, and now like pickleball is the fastest growing sport. So when we think about this land, we have to think about not just for today, but for tomorrow as well. So that's something we have to think about. Next, this is a very important one. Collaborate with community partners and get input. So uh, six, seven years ago, when we you know had the second uh, round of this, you know, we invited uh, <coughs> community in, you know, all the youth organizations, adult organizations, neighbors, school, to get their feedback. So what, what should this land be used for? How, how do you use it? So we feel that's important as, as well as a goal for us. Um, and then coordinate with key stakeholders. This is another important piece because when we look at this land, we look at it holistically. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if the school or youth organization wants to add something to this land, we have to make sure we're all aligned. You know, again, it's it's our land, right? It's not the school's land, it's not the town, it's not the baseball's land, it's all of ours. <laughs> so we have to make sure that when something's gonna be built there, it makes sense. So this is what we wanna do, is coordinate with everybody. And that's my part, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike, who you know, the survey for us and pulled it all together, give us the, the data. So, um, I'm Mike Coleman. The, uh, the key parts on the survey is it, it went out in December 2018, early December. It was out for about a month, and we got over 1,100 respondents, which is a, a big increase over what was 2015. Um, I hope you all saw it. I don't know if you all saw it. Awesome. Um, so this is the, the results, the highest usage we asked it, the, the respondents to, to tell us how they use this area. These add up to more than 100% because you could s select multiple <coughs> ways that you use this area. So it's organized to sports, running and walking. It's a pretty, pretty big area. Um, and ice skating. I, I had no idea there were so many ice skating. <laughs> uh, and playground use. I think Vanessa brought up a good point in the last meeting. I think it was you. You're like, well, was this sent out in the winter? Because that's when the kids normally ice skate. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it was right. on the radar, but it was a good point. And then these were the most desired improvements that, that were identified in the town. So the, the key thing is that people would like restrooms out there. And the other is walking and running paths, trails. Uh, and I think those were the, the two big takeaways that, that we got uh, from the surveys. Um, it's you know, interesting to me anyway that a skateboard park wasn't a high, uh, high interest. Um, so, next one. We also had a couple targeted questions on the survey because we were trying we, we get lots of feedback from youth groups and all sorts of other people about things going on in, in, uh, in the area. So we wanted to ask specifically, did people think that lighting, the lighting of the uh, area needed to be upgraded? And 80%, uh, more than 80% thought that it, it, it did. These are old, these are pictures of the lights. They're, it's kind of old infrastructure, uh, the poles and things like that. This is a beautiful picture of how it might. And the other one that we tossed in because it had come up in discussion was um, early Sunday morning play, or prior to noon Sunday play uh, for some of the recreational fair uh, fields. Um, and 80% of the respondents thought that this would be okay. 
So those were our targeted questions. It's probably the most not a what well, a scientific way to do a survey because if you ask a particular question you're gonna get a particular answer. But it's a data point that the, these things are. So um Oh, is this the switching now? I, I forget whether we switch here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. So Mary Ellen Killian, just taking it at this point. So again, if you can see from actually the three survey results, so three rounds from 2007, 2014 to this one, very consistent answers from the community that responded. And so the running and walking paths or trails additional or improved lighting down there and restrooms so i don't think this is new to many people but it just to keep it on your radar that this is what most of the respondents to the survey do have in mind so for instance we just wanted to throw um, this graphic up which was a rendering of uh, upgraded walkways and trails around uh, Birch Meadow and there's various uh, concepts and various um, ideas to it but this gives a nicer view of actually for instance the Higgins property over here on the left hand side and as well as over here on the, on the north side so this kind of gives you an idea of like adding some walking trails as well as going into there um, and as you can understand that some of the walking trails were um, uh, we need we would really like them to be uh, very durable for who's going on them and who's using them and I know that there's various uh, materials you can use for that but again if this is um, I think this would be a great improvement to the area as I agree with some of the respondents <coughs> that um, making it safe down there and that kind of leads into the lighting situation um, I think people are fearful that we're thinking to just illuminate that place, but I think what we really want to do is make it safe down there, so when people are walking that it's safely illuminated and properly illuminated. Again, not these high resolution lights, but ones that are help you go along that walkway. So just, just a proposal, not anything set in stone. And can I also just add that after the survey went out and one of the top needs of the community or wants of the community wants um, was the running and walking trails we reached out to the trails committee and we reached out to Kim Honischlager and they took the time and made this whole map for us mm -hmm. and came into a meeting um, Ben Rehm from the trails committee came into the meeting presented this to us in the meeting and they also met with conservation um, because we had some questions that consistently come up right. about Higgins, about Castine, what can and cannot be done there. So we're already proactively meeting with other internal departments and trying to get on the same page together. And when we work together, we're stronger, right? right. Um, and it's good to have each other's support. And she, I, this is phenomenal. I, I was shocked that she even brought this to us, so. Before we leave this slide, for those people that may not be as familiar, you sure. identified the Higgins Land. Can you identify the Castine area? This is Castine right here. This is on that bend from John Carver Road. Uh, these are what they call the lighted softball fields, so three softball fields. This area here is the uh, what they call now the area across from Birch Meadow, the parking lot across from Birch Meadow. For those who've been here for a long time, this is the old Imagination Station area. Um, and then these are like the groves and the um, cops of the hill. I want to say the cops on the hill, the hill cops, the tree, the cops of trees in the hill. Um, tennis courts, um, top lots down here. These are some uh, basketball and like a, kind of just a surface area down there. Um, Morton, and that kind of brings us back. Thank you. Welcome. I think I have one more slide. Will the lot be at the SBAD gate compliant? That's what I'm, I'm 
referring to is that they should be, need to be durable for everyone who lives out there. Exactly. Exactly. So again, what we really would love to do, and moving forward on this, since this is our third iteration since I've been on the um, uh, Recreation Committee too, is really to work with um, the key stakeholders, so uh, residents, um, town departments, uh, organizations that use that field are our top people, but I know there's many other people who you know need to be involved in that. Um, again, we'd love to move forward on upgrading the current lighting for the Birch Meadow, again, to provide um, safe and active recreation opportunities. And what we really love to try to do this time, which has really not happened in any of the other two times, is to try to move forward with like a landscape architect to develop some conceptual plan of what can really go on down there. And I think uh, in my view of this, it's always really hard to do a master plan because everyone thinks everything needs to be set in stone right away. But I think that concept gives us a great idea of what can be done down there. And then we get down to the real good formidable and formative design prospects that work in that area. Like keeping that whole big picture to make it, uh, again, useful to everybody, as well as a very good, solid plan that's for now and for the future. Thank you. I think Wonderful. that's the end. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Questions or comments? Um, great presentation, first of all. Thank you very much. Very, very uh, insightful. Um, I'm wondering in the goals, you talk about community input, which I think is great. I'd love to see a discussion of community output also, meaning having the community participate in implementation and other activities, mm -hmm. whether it's construction or contribution or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it's great to see what, what folks want. We'll all be challenged at some point to decide where the dollars are going to go and how many they're going to be. Mm -hmm. And getting some community output might be a great way to, to help with that. So maybe, maybe just, just uh, on that one. Um, Imagination Station, the old Imagination Station, the former, um, that's part of the complex, but it's kind of it's kind of not doing anything. It holds equipment yes. in the winter and does other things. Yes. Is there any discussion about what We'd love might to happen? Utilize it. The, there has been. Um, it's been on the Birch Meadow Master Plan since the beginning. Uh, the proposal was to pave that area. However, we did have conservation in one of our meetings, and there may be some um, discussion on what can and cannot be paved because it does abut a wetland. So. Yeah, or maybe look at alternatives not paving it and, and turning it into right um, on the master plan yeah. that is what's proposed currently but certainly it can change um, but what's proposed cannot be done from the last meeting that we have with conservation so okay. might have to look mean, at other creatives how does that to what Mary Ellen said in terms of working with this outside vendor the architect that would help us say okay here's this land yeah, and vision what, what are some concepts for it you know I don't think I think it's, it's no decisions have been made yet you know, I think our responsibility is to meet, get, you know, all this feedback together, hand it off to an expert to come back with us with some concepts and for us to have those discussions and conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Are, are there any um, architects, landscape architects, whatever, that are participating with the Rec Committee so far, as in town residents? As in pre. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, but... No. <laughs> Excellent translation. <laughs> I don't know if that's an opportunity. Um, I, I think about the Permanent Building Committee, which yeah. has been an incredible way to leverage yeah. people in town who have these capabilities, and I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity. I, Is yeah. that a worth like conflict of interest, though? I just don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it, it could get form, become something more formal if need be. But, yeah. yeah. So I have a question from Bill. Yeah, it, it's interesting to know uh, if you go back to the 1930 master plan for this plan, it really isn't a heck of a lot of difference. <laughs> and prior to that, in 1898, uh, there was a young fellow that came up from Boston. <coughs> called, uh, his name was Frederick Holmstead. I don't know if you ever remember him or not. Mm. But he was here and suggested all the way from Bobbin Street up to 
Flower Street has a pack. We didn't listen to it then. <laughs> we heard about that on Charter Day. <laughs> um, one more question also. You mentioned the, the Sunday morning discussion. Um, is that something that's coming back to the Rec Committee for action? Where, where does that stand? It's your jurisdiction. Yeah, that, that's your, your policy. Your jurisdiction, uh, I have an ability to do one waiver per year. Yeah. And then beyond that, someone has to come ask you. So that can be a future discussion on policy. Great. I would suggest that we have that discussion. Okay. So, I, I would also suggest you have it soon because of their change in the start of the high school. It's going to change a lot of schedules generally yeah. and compress the afternoon. There'll be a lot of opinions on that. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then I'll add it for uh, other questions from the board for. Um. Well, I went to their meeting, so so um, I don't really have any uh, questions, s except for uh, one which we didn't we didn't cover, and, and that Mark just br brought up. I, I really like Mark's idea of first of all, you've done a great job of coordinating with trails and conservation. I think that's fantastic, um, and that's the way to prevent problems from arising and to make things go smoothly. So. Um, I greatly appreciate um, you all doing that. Um, but maybe adding, I like Mark's suggestion of considering adding another component, which would be um, uh, community output, getting the community involved, um, if that's possible. Um, the Imagination Station, when I was a, a young, very tired father, <laughs> I, I re remember loving that place. And I, I saw a lot of other parents in the same situation, <laughs> sitting tiredly on the bench. Hands out like this. Yeah, and, then, the and the kids were just going <laughs> crazy and having a great time. Um, is, there, is there anything like that in town now? And, and should there be? Should the, have you thought of this as a spot for that? We're not tied to anything, and I think that's why, you know, getting back to the original playground era, uh, aspect, because I remember mm -hmm. when that was torn down, we were mm -hmm. hoping to put yeah. a skate park in there. So mm -hmm. whatever iteration goes in, I know uh, the concession was to upgrade the Bancroft lot, which is, you know, much farther on the other side, but yeah. uh, we're open to anything that the architectural landscape architect yeah. And at the time, um, would end was improved to really state-of-the-art handicapped accessible playground mm -hmm. why that location it was just an opportunity but that was also yeah. meant to replace right imagination right. station if you will but uh, not the same central location yeah that's the thing right this is near elementary school uh, yeah, middle school high school yeah. high school so so I just have I, I have a comment on, on that. It was it was mentioned that it was it was thought of for uh, to pave it for parking, um, but we the subcommittee sort of wanted to get the traffic uh, and parking issues uh, um, off the table. We didn't really want to discuss that at the time until we had some more sense of how to use the, the area. But there are there we would have to think about some of that. Because there is equipment parked there and other things the parked, yeah. and that might involve that. more of Birch Meadow Drive all the way around. How you do parking on that mm -hmm. whole drive? Mm -hmm. So but we didn't want to talk about that. Yeah, the, the schools have a pretty strong opinion that they need and use parking, mm -hmm. um, and whether the why it does or doesn't, they're different than us, but they also use it. Um, as with anything, it's it's lied vacant for so long that people use it for parking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, as you generally mentioned, uh, because of conservation reasons, we can't pave it as parking. Yeah. So the traffic and the parking has to go somewhere. And that's before you decide, just put you know, put pickleball there, and you have to figure out where the cars go. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? This was wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Let's take a two minute break and then we will be back Set up with the a training program. Yeah. Recommendations.
What's the matter? Right. <laughs> Everything's good. All right, we're in good shape. So next up, uh, we've been asked to approve some renovations to the train depot. Um, my understanding is that the applicant is not here, um, although we do have the historical commission here. So if you'd like to call yourselves to order. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jonathan Barnes. I'm the chair of the. Um, and historical commission and along with us uh, most of the other members so I would like to call we did post this uh, first time meeting so I would like to call our meeting uh, to order at this point if I can um, because we don't have uh, our regular all of our regular members here perhaps we will we introduce ourselves but I would like to um, take the opportunity in the absence of the other members to designate two of our associate members um, as regular members for purposes of this evening's discussion. Um, so I would designate uh, Virginia Adams, and um, since our other two associates are appointed at exactly the same time, I'll just do it alphabetical order, so I'll, I'll designate Pino as a, as a regular member tonight. Great, thank you. Um, so the applicants are not here, so um, my thought was that we could hear from um, historical commission if they have any comments that they'd like to make um, and then we continue the hearing to July 9th to give them the opportunity to be present if at that time they do not communicate with the town or with the historical commission on their intention to participate then we can move forward at that time um, so do we have a Oh. I'm just, um, I misspoke when I talked to you earlier. Uh, technically, it's not a hearing, so you don't have to pick a time. You oh. can just say we're going to pick this up to the next agenda, and that's fine. Well, and then we also, that means don't have to. You don't have to vote. Have to do anything. Okay. Uh, so, Jonathan, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jonathan, you want to sit up here? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how best to proceed. Um, this was not, thank you, Mr. This was not. Uh, our our request or proposal but the applicant uh is uh jim d'amico who's the owner of the Reading depot and i'm sure everybody's familiar with the depot i i did have by the way uh some photos to put i have them on a thumb drive i was going to put it up um in the course of a presentation if it got to that not nearly as as effective as the last powerpoint <laughs> presentation but it was just <laughs> pictures but at this point i probably refrain um until we actually may have the discussion. Um, the architect and the contractor who's done the, the uh, interior renovations on the depot, Jeanette Cataldo is the individual who submitted the, this particular request for the um, exterior color change. Um, I, and I had several communications with her uh, as I, um, Select Board Member Friedman, um, and actually the entire Select Board met with her on the interior changes in the fall. Um, I had several conversations with her uh, about the process. Um, and uh, she submitted the proposal to you and to us. I think it's a, it's a gray color with a slate blue interior. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the, with the current color, which are uh, historically accurate colors, uh, which I would go into in the presentation, but I'll refrain from right now. They are the original uh, livery colors, if you will, um, which is railroad parlance for uh, rolling stock, railroad rolling stock color scheme and markings. They are the original um, livery colors of the Boston and Maine Railroad, which was the railroad that came in in 1845, uh, put in the track, put in the original depot, put in uh, that depot. Um, and then operated there uh, for uh, well over 100 years from 1845 until the 1950s. Um, <coughs> In, in any event, the, the request came in. Uh, there was some communication which I'd like to address um, after this discussion. Um, I informed her um, that it was on for the board, uh, select board meeting this evening. Um, she emailed me this morning, Jeanette, uh, and indicated that the owner, Jim D'Amico, is not able to make it this evening. Could the select board continue the review without them? Um, I did speak to her. Um, in response to that and indicated that I presumed that the select board could. I didn't know whether they would want to, um, but I wanted her to know, since she was not at that point aware, that the Historical Commission had met 
um, another point which I'll address in a moment, um, and had come to the consensus that we would recommend uh, to retain the original historic colors. I wanted her to know that and that we were intending to make a presentation this evening, um, so I didn't want her um, to be caught unaware if it, if it was to go forward as she had requested without their presence. And I had suggested to her that if she wanted to uh, seek to postpone it, I would be happy since I had had communication with her and with the uh, select board with Caitlin, um, I would be happy to, to present that, um, that request uh, to the select board. Um, she went back and forth and asked, uh, we had some conversation about what was the reason for our, our opinion to retain the colors. Um, and after that discussion, uh, she indicated that she would discuss it with the owner um, as to whether or not he could come or his son, whose business actually is in there now, um, could make it. Brian D'Amico is his name, I think. Um, and uh, she would let me know if they wanted to postpone it. I did not hear from her. Uh, she had my cell phone and my email and my text information. So I don't know what their intentions are. Um, so I'd be happy to present my information, or as you had suggested, it might be best um, to go forward with it uh, at, a, at a subsequent meeting. And I would be happy if you if you would wish to uh, to have any conversation with her. But I guess I'd ask for your direction. Okay. Um, my inclination is, since the applicant isn't here, to ask that the presentation wait until our next meeting, July 9th. Mm -hmm. Is there time in that agenda? Truthfully, it's it's a little tight, but. Is there no, later. Is the <laughs> <laughs> You're it's fine, but then don't blame yeah. us. Um, no, no. <laughs> I, I should interject that she did in my conversation with her specifically ask if the select board could ever meet during the day, <laughs> which I told her was likely not possible. Uh, is there any urgency in this matter? It's because it's not an official hearing. We could technically yeah, push, push, push it until August. Next meeting is August. Our first really meeting is August really sixth. Or the 20. I don't know if there's any urgency. She didn't communicate that to me at all. So she may have communicated that as Bob has indicated. She yeah, she, they did communicate to me. I, I laid out the schedule that you changed. And they said uh, they really would like to get to it before August. Okay. So I offered them the two dates. So we'll always make it work on the 9th. I mean, there's some things Caitlin's already advertised that have to stay where they are, but we'll figure it out if that's convenient for them. And either Jonathan or I or our other staff can catch up. Can I make one, one comment? It, it sounds like it would be great for the, for the board and the owner and the contractor to work together before coming back here. And see what you can get done. Commission. What do you say, the board? Do you mean the select board? No. Or? The, 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 the historical, historical commission. Sorry. To see what you know, if if, if things are absolutely stopped, that's fine. But it sounds like there hasn't really been much discussion yet. So there hasn't, and I, and I very much appreciate that, and I'd like yeah. I'd like to address that. Although I. I don't. I, I don't know whether that's possible. I know that uh, that their choice was the the gray and slate blue. I know that's the color inside. I, I have had a tour um, inside, um, and uh, in my conversation with her, uh, other than indicate that they wanted it to be that color and did not want to retain the existing color. Um, she didn't say anything further. Um, I explained that it was a, it was historically correct, and that that was the reason why, and that it was used predominantly in a lot of their, um, other uh, depot buildings and other facilities. Um, so I have no idea whether we would be able to to reach any alternative it, agreement. I, I think that's okay. I just think it's important that the the groups sit down together and, and talk. And it, it may be that you can come together. It may be that you can't. But it seems that that would be better done before coming back to the board meeting schedule before this. Um, or is that other meeting? What, what's the Thank you. R Ron um, and Bob, is it, um, it seems to me that it would be good standard operating procedure that when these um, deed restriction requests come in that are, have uh, historical uh, restrictions, deed restrictions, that the um, uh, that the historical commission get involved um, immediately at the at the start, because I think it will make the process move along more efficiently. Um, you think that happened? I, yeah, I, okay. they have. They did have a meeting about it. Yes. Well, that was, and I would like to address that. Um, but first, I should say. Um, 
Andy, you, you, I think you referred to me as Ron, which I know oh. we, we've had this we've had this issue before. That's another uh, that's another member. Um, and I'm tired it's, parent. Yes. Well, I, oh, I, actually, yeah. it's a, I actually think it's an <laughs> older tired because he's parent. called me a lot worse than Ron. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did want to raise that issue uh, because this this situation developed in in kind of a. Um, unusual way, which I did at least want to want to raise um, in an effort to um, to make it more more efficient. And thank you for the for the opportunity, um, Jonathan, to <laughs> to, uh, to address it. Um, the issue came up uh, with Jeanette Cataldo's email uh, requesting the, mm -hmm. the the color change on um, the 11th of June in the afternoon. Uh, I and, and by the way, that was an email request to the RHC email address, the Reading Historical Commission email address. Um, I check that probably more often than I should, as, as I know other, other commission members do, but I, I didn't have a chance to respond to that um, before an email came back to me from the town, uh, which was a heads up, which I very much appreciated, uh, indicating that, it, that it, an email response had already been sent uh, by an employee of town um, to the applicant, to Jeanette, um, advising if she could submit a proposal to the select board mm -hmm. before the 19th so that it could be on the agenda for the 25th. Now, there were two things that, that left me a little um, unsettled about that. One was it was an email to us. Um, it was an email to the Historical Commission to which I, I, I've been on the commission for five years and I'm not aware of any um, any email to the Reading Historical Commission email address that's been answered by um, by somebody other than the Reading Historical Commission. So that was kind of peculiar. And more important, there was no communication with, with me or with us before that. And that's that's important for, for that reason alone. But it's, it's also important because we, although we did coincidentally, we scheduled our meetings on a monthly basis. So we scheduled the June meeting in May. And that happened to be on June 12th, the following day. And that's the only reason why why we were able to have a com we at the commission were able to have a conversation about it. Um, but uh, I didn't have any conversation with anybody at the town uh, before that, so I didn't have any opportunity to, to discuss with, with the town before it was put on the agenda, or was about to be put on the agenda for the 25th. I didn't have an opportunity to discuss uh, with them whether or not we'd be able to even have a meeting. We only meet monthly. So it would, it would, um, it would really be m more efficient if, if the communication was, was more, um, more direct, I guess I would, I would suggest. Um, I then followed up with Jeanette just because I, I normally do respond, and I did. I did. I was uncomfortable because it was to our commission, so um, I did communicate to her. But um, I, I just wanted to ra raise that issue. It was just fortune, good fortune, that we happened to have the meeting on the twelfth, and we were so I did have the opportunity to discuss it at our meeting. Okay. Um, so it does sound like the process was handled. It just had a little bit of, and I know it's been done similarly in the past. Um, so I think from a moving forward perspective, I would suggest that we add this to our July 9th meeting, but we can discuss agendas more specifically later um, to give the applicant time to attend. If they, if they choose not to attend um, or we don't hear anything otherwise from them, we can hear from commission and see what they have to say would you want me I'm um, would you want me to follow up with Jeanette uh, we, we can or you can okay. whatever you're coming whatever, whatever, your, whatever I mean, your preference we, we will uh, all right I'll leave it with Bob then okay. um, all right great so um, we'll Bill talk. Talk. We'll okay. time to hire an elephant by then <laughs> No. We've already done that once. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've been running she knows. The last time they wanted to paint the, uh, the and did it end up being gray? And oyster white. Yeah, somebody said it had to be elephant gray, so they went out and hired an elf, believe it or not, to walk it by the station. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> thank you, Bill. Uh, Jonathan and all, thank you very much for coming in. Um, if you'd like to join us again on July 9th, we'd love to have you. If not, please feel free to send a representative to speak on your behalf. All right. Thanks thank you. very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. You will adjourn. All right. Oh, yes, I, I should adjourn. <laughs> And I will adjourn. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next up, we have the depot parking sticker. Um, so this topic came up um, a couple of years ago. The fee for the park for parking at the train depot was increased from twenty-five dollars to one hundred and fifty. 
um, and we have been asked to revisit this. I think it's been in place now a year and a half, Bob? Correct. Okay. Um, and uh, there have been some concerns that have been raised, among them um, a senior discount, which Mark, you mentioned, I know John, uh, John Halsey mentioned it previously, and uh, reduced fee, cost of fee for a second car or something to make it a little bit more affordable if you have two cars that park in the train depot. Um, I, my sort of general comment on this is I'd like to know, because this is a fee, I'd like to make sure that we have justification for the cost of it. This was, there was an estimate that was provided two years ago now for the cost of maintaining it, uh, plowing, painting, lines, etc. So from my perspective, in order to justify this, to continue to justify this cost, I'd like to know what it costs us as a town to maintain it. Okay. I would imagine that needs to include security and Ticketing. maintenance, you know, mm -hmm. all the different aspects, just to make sure. Yep. Would it also be possible, Bob, to find out um, the number of stickers Absolutely. that were issued in yep. the past versus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, to mm -hmm. be clear, I, I don't remember one of your August agendas, this is scheduled, and they just wanted to give staff some time to answer whatever questions you might have in advance. Yeah. I figured that we could pose all of our questions to Bob, and then we'd have yeah. a lot of yeah. presentation. I, I, Martin, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Martin, you were asking about. Um, you know, the the number of stickers issued since the change, yeah, right mm -hmm. for before and after, right before and after, right. after. Yeah, yeah. Be yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and also, excuse me, just for one more thing, yeah. I think did the MBTA lot has changed their rates in the period also, haven't they? Yes, mm -hmm. of course, they I think have. upward. <laughs> I would think so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty sure that safe one. guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering what utilization rates are mm -hmm. uh, also. Yeah. It might be nice to okay. go back two years. The two years up to the change and then two, two years prior and then two years prior and then the year, yeah. Um, yeah, as far as the senior discount, I I think we should have a senior discount personally. Um. <coughs> So the council brought up both a discount and the ability for uh, more frail members to have a, a preferred parking spot, basically. But I didn't quite follow because I would imagine that if they're, they're very frail, they may have a handicap accessible sticker. Yeah. And I also, I, is it possible to find out what the utilization is of the handicapped spots? Yes, so they typically full. Mm. Are there vacancies? Often absent vacancies. Yeah, where are they and how are they? Yeah, yeah. No. yeah. The, the, their concerns just were that there are some people, some seniors who um, end up parking there to get into town. There are some seniors who park there to get onto the train. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. those are the questions. Well, and handicap, that's actually a really interesting observation because the handicapped spots are in that small lot on the inside. So if we're talking about seniors who are using those to access town, the town area, presumably Haven Street. They have to cross the tracks. They have to cross the tracks. That's not particularly handicap accessible friendly. Um, I would wonder if it would be more worthwhile to make handicap spots on that side of Haven to make it more senior friendly. Yeah. Or for, for generally handicap some. friendly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Bob, so maybe, maybe we'll give you a wider presentation of handicap spots in the downtown area just so you're all familiar yeah. with that. I think that'd be great. Um, as for the second uh, car, I know John raised the question of having a placard that could be transferred from one car to the other. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who has two cars and has, not this year, but in the past, had two cars that sometimes alternate which one is in use at the depot, I find that the placard idea that is movable to be non-family friendly. <laughs> um, it's just not practical when you're racing out the door and you're at the mercy of the train schedule to remember the placard. And if you have one parent um, or household member that leaves very early, they could very well take off with the placard and then you're stuck. Um, so I would be in favor of two stickers and still have a discounted rate for the second one. Um, I wanted to, I think that's a good idea. I wanted to uh, rewind a little bit, though, and remember, uh, rem uh, well, Vanessa and I were on the board when we made this leap from 25 uh, to 150. And the, the, the feedback we got at the time was the question is, if you, you, you raise it to 150, combined compost and parking, um, will, uh, What's the difference in the amount of tickets we sold at 25, and and um, 
then subsequently the, the following years what if we sold at 150 and we've talked about that in mm -hmm. the past I think that'd be important information to to gather um, are we selling as many um, as we did when it was 25 or what you know is the town really um, yeah, what's the delta? Yeah, what, what, yeah, you know, what was the effect of this, as I think you said at the time? Mm -hmm. um, well, I can tell you the um, maybe unintended but known or predictable consequence is that, you know, as someone who lives within walking distance of mm -hmm. the depot, yeah. there's a lot more cars in my neighborhood now. Yeah. Um, yeah and a lot more people walking, we've heard. Yeah, I'm one of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not a bad outcome. Yeah. No, that, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but, yeah. It's not always the most convenient in the winter, I will say that much. Yeah. Um, so do we have any other questions or information that we'd like them to present when this comes forward again? Um, I, I have a question idea based off of what Vanessa said. Um, if, right, the movable placard, um, that's going to cause a lot of family strife, would be my guess. And, um, personal opinion. Yeah, personal opinion. <laughs> um, and is it possible to have uh, a, a sticker issued either with the same number so um, or with a number where the police can enter enter it in and note that um, this car so people from the house both of them you couldn't park both of car, both of the cars at the depot with those those two stairs. Yeah, so if, if that's the objective, and that had been previously the discussed objective, and most beaches do it that way, they'll offer you two or three or four uh, license plates, but one hanger. So only one person can go at a mm -hmm. time. Um, the police department, to speak for them, would strongly prefer stickers, not hangers, because it's just harder to see the hanger yeah. for the traffic enforcement. <laughs> Um, if you want to sell a second, third, or fourth sticker per family at a discounted rate, that's doable. That's the way it used to work. Mm -hmm. The yeah. board just decided not to do that way before. So rather than get too complicated about same numbers and all that, just, yeah, yeah. just say, you know, if you've got the same address, second sticker is cheaper, third yeah. sticker is cheaper, whatever. Yeah. It also has some concerns yeah. about out-of-town people attempting to lure their friends in <laughs> to get them a placard. We usually make them show a driver's license yeah. that shows the same address. Right, but if then you're going to put the placard in the car and then to rely on the whoever is doing enforcement to be well, checking it, things the every license day. plate, it has to match, match the registration, so. Yeah, no, it, so when they sign up for it, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And when they check. When, the, they, the, when they check the stickers, they're looking at the registration. Yeah, I, I just don't want to create an incentive um, right. where people would either Cheat. find a car that's open and remove the placard <laughs> or yeah. outsource their residency. Right, right. right. I, I don't I want do to see that. it on eBay. I, I think, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 you know what, what Bob said, I think that's, that you can't do that. Yeah. Because they they check the license plate. Yeah, yeah. If, if they're checking very regularly, which of course would increase our costs of maintaining that. They're checking uh, every instant. <laughs> exactly. I, I think simple usually is a great solution. Right. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think going back to the old system of you come in with two registrations for your cars and you get two stickers, they put your license plate on them and mm -hmm. put that's that in the car. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. All right. Can I retract that request, Bob? No, that's fine. <laughs> um, all right. Any other questions for Bob on this? Okay. Um, so, Bob, I think we have this on the agenda for August. Yes. Okay. So, next up, we have town manager goals. So uh, the goal here, no pun intended, is to have um, a quick review of Bob's 2019 goals and to preview um, potential goals for 2020. Um, and one of the things I think that should be discussed as we go through this is the current goal setting process because there has been pretty unanimous discussion and agreement that there's 20 goals or 25 goals is a little excessive and we may want to change how we set goals um, either more specifically more targeted um, and less things that are sort of part of the nature of the job that he does um, so Bob I'll hand it over to you okay, thank you um, I'll go pretty fast through the 19 and a little slower through the 20 and if anyone's not comfortable please just let me know and I'll mostly discuss the uh, FY19 goals that are different 
Um, we gave an update just after the election in April, mm -hmm. uh, somewhat quick one. Um, this will be the last one that probably requires agenda time. I'll hand something out that's not going to be much different in July when the year's actually done. Um, there are a few things here that, for instance, um, just to jump ahead, number seven, historical preservation. We're on a grant schedule, so the last bit has to be done specifically in the month of either August or September. So we can't do it this fiscal year, but it will get done within the grant year. Um, senior Center, Community Center. Um, one of the things I want to discuss with FY20 is when this something like that is a goal, what do you mean? What is the first year objective? What does a fire picture look like? We didn't expect to build a new senior center in one year. It was to start the discussion, and the discussion has clearly started. Um, you know, it's in town meeting. It's just about everywhere you go. Um, you know, the board's pretty well familiar. We haven't done a lot of presentations with you, um, just just the one that you had uh, last winter. Um, it's, it's difficult to know what the next step is, and I appreciate the fact you have a subcommittee working on that, as well as liaisons to help guide that. Um, the Permanent Building Committee, I've had some discussions, especially with the chair, and, and their, their preference is to join a project later on, not up front, because it's not really a project yet, mm -hmm. but they just did want to indicate um, they, are, they are willing to provide their assistance and resources. They do have expertise. Um, neither of us see a point at the project now for that to happen, but just so you're clear, they are available a little earlier in the process than they formally would, would step in. Um, the elementary school space needs. Again, there's going to be an update this coming Thursday at the school committee meeting. Um, I don't really have a lot to add. They studied a number of options. They're still in wet underway, and there's just going to be a summary presentation. Um, one objective is for this to be discussed more thoroughly under reports for November town meeting, as John indicated last April when he gave a report. And it's still somewhat of an open question to dis be decided by the school committee um, what public discussion happens between now and November town meeting. Um, I, I know with the finance committee there has been discussion about you know, capital planning as being an important topic for this fall. I started working on the capital plan yesterday, which is early for, for that. <clears throat> and also uh, to discuss an update of the building security project in the fall that could be discussed publicly. So um, those are all planned and, and understood. It's less clear whether this elementary school space needs will benefit from a discussion this fall as opposed to just an updated November town meeting. But uh, this Thursday we might all learn a little more. Um, the third one, the uh, wayfinding, that's complete, although the signs aren't up yet. The weather slowed us down a little, uh, but that project has been complete. Whether people find their way to Reddings downtown was, remains to be seen. Um, we actually have had some compliments, much to my surprise. I don't notice signs. I'm a guy. I just don't notice signs. Um, but we've had some compliments about the new banners that are up and, in fact, about general signage. So. One person at the Friends and Family Day said, I just want to tell you that the town is doing a terrific job with signage in this town. And I was like, I knew there was someone that would feel <laughs> that way, and I finally met you. <laughs> I was just I was a little surprised about that. Um, but there had been a lot of discussion with the business community, and it, as Mark and I discussed, one of the real challenges is to get people who are going to be interested later in a negative way to come out early mm -hmm. so they can hear their views and opinions. And, We've had different business owners in for different reasons, and um, you know, usually an early discussion is just so much more helpful than a later discussion, just from everyone's perspective, so they understand they're part of the solution. So, see if we can work on that. Uh, longer term planning, um, you will have a meeting, I believe it's scheduled for September, uh, from uh, you know, one of the one of the companies we hired again with a different grant, Gamble and Associates. They've had some pretty interesting ideas. Um, I and staff have met with just about every landowner or property owner down there, um, which is really interesting. And um, they're really uh, very much a good partner as a group, uh, very working collaboratively. I want to have another meeting with the light department because we haven't done that recently, but everyone else has been in for a visit even in one, time, one time collectively, a group of them in one time one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as Mark knows, we've hired a new economic development director. He's met Aaron. Um, she's happy to come visit the board whenever it's convenient, uh, even just as hello. Great. Yeah. 
I would hope to get some guidance and help from Andy and Mark on that. I, it's kind of, it's to me, it's two very different purposes. Downtown is something important. Economic development across the community is different, but it's it's always really important, and, and at least I believe this that economic development in other parts of the community is not meant to replace or harm downtown. It's meant to add to it. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a lot of connectivity issues and connecting Walkersbrook to downtown. Just think about it; it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, it involves a very dangerous intersection, a, a crazy yeah. Route 28, and train tracks. So. No, it's not going to be easy, but that's important to solve that. <clears throat> um, we talked about the master plan, nothing has changed, cable negotiations is finished, the archival project, no change, there's just something scheduled, as you can see, in September. Um, you know, we had more community events than I had imagined. Um, <laughs> staff was not was not running the 375th, and I certainly don't mean to take anything away from Alan and Jean and all those people, but a lot of staff was involved in a lot of meetings, as it turned out, and not, not to my knowledge until later. It's like, oh yeah, I was busy on the 375th. So it was really nice to see a community-led effort in two weeks. Uh, it came up last night in, in the appointment committee meeting. Alan had said 25 years ago it was also two weeks, but it was a lot of stuff to cram into two weeks. Mm -hmm. And they were very fortunate, maybe it was good planning, but very fortunate with the weather. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. All the outdoor yeah. events, weather was perfect, in between it rained. Yeah. Right. It couldn't yeah. have been any better. Yeah. So I know Absolutely. Alan was very aware and appreciative of that. Um, you know, we just, as I've said, and, and as you know, um, when groups get to come in and speak to the board just for 10 minutes about one of their events, they're really appreciative of that. So the Jams for Jake people, the Garden Sale people, you know, again, we're very appreciative. And we'll have the Fall Street Fair Committee come in sometime before the Fall Street Fair in September. Okay. It's, um, it's especially nice for the community events to happen because at least my observation from Friends and Family Day is every single comment I heard was positive. John Halsey had one negative comment that I didn't really hear, but I knew it was happening, and he later said, yeah, that was a negative comment. For, so for the whole day, that was all. Um, I just actually asked the school committee chair today, because she was there a lot of the day. I said, what was your experience? She said everything was so positive. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you as a board, uh, me as an employee, we tend to hear the complaints. Mm -hmm. It's just really nice to remember and be reminded most of the town is very happy, because <laughs> we don't see that. So it was great to see that. Uh, senior tax relief, you're going to get something from Victor. Um, he was just at a conference all last week. Uh, he'll be in to see you this summer to talk about the extension of, of senior tax relief. There's no update. Um, tax classification has also been done. Um, let's see. The next two areas of update, um, public works and later finance department policies and procedures. Um, Ray has worked on both of these. Um, I have looked at them, but I need to have another look at Ray's work. Uh, they are both scheduled on your agendas as soon as we could schedule them. Um, I'm, I met with Sharon today, and I'm going to suggest, and I think she's going to agree, and hopefully you will, that financial policies need to be its own section for your policies. So right now it's tucked into some areas. But you have DPW policies as a section. You ought to have finance policies as a section. So if you have eight articles, then maybe you just need nine. Uh, and she'll work on that with town council. Um, mm. Where we had a little bit of a struggle, and I don't know how to resolve it, is where, where do f FinCom policies and select board finance policies delineate? <laughs> Um, that's just something I, I may want to come back and talk to you a little more in detail, or she may when she comes in in a quarterly update. Um, there are policies, when FinCom adopts it, it's pretty clear it's a FinCom policy. Um, but FinCom or you could adopt some policies. It's not as clear. So that's just food for thought. And I have not had a discussion with FinCom uh, since they canceled tomorrow night. Um, so again, they'll both be in to see you. Uh, building security, I really don't have a lot of updates since um, town meeting. I did have a meeting with, uh, with John and his staff last Thursday. Um, we are now down to the spreadsheets and the nitty gritty of, you know, what goes in and what can't be afforded. Um, no surprise that everything added up is more than four million, which we knew. 
Uh, the question is how to prioritize it. And then um, when we assemble a bid package, we're trying to do it in a thoughtful way, which allows us flexibility um, you know, to react to prices that come in differently than we expect, either up or down. We, we just don't know. Some of the stuff we're doing is pretty liquid in the markets. You have a pretty good idea of the price, but some of it's not as, as bad as a sewer station, but it's just very infrequent and it's really hard to, to guess. Um, you know, you'll get more definitely on that in the fall. But so far, things are going along really well. And the, uh, the OPM and the uh, project manager we have, uh, I'm sorry, um, architect we have are working together really, really well. Excuse me, but there, there will be a, an RFQ issued uh, probably September, maybe August. Um, is it singular RFQ with the notion there'll be a general contractor doing everything, or is that, it more That's still a pieces? slightly open question. Um, one of the questions is, do you have a construction firm do all the work in the police department, for instance? Or do you have a construction firm do the dispatch center, and then a different construction firm do all the building security improvements? So we, we haven't solved that yet. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, six months ago, we were leaning to having two, and now we're thinking if we can find one, it's just much more efficient. Get in the building, do all your work, get out of the building. So uh, either is possible, but probably one. And if that one is able to do that, they'll do all the all the work if they're qualified. So that's a good question. Um, the answer is not carved in stone yet. Uh, and again, there will be an update uh, Thursday night with the school committee on this one. Um, emergency plans all done. Bylaws are done. I think that's it. Um, you know, we we have uh, reacquired some employees on waiver wires, as it were. So uh, the hiring markets are still very tough. Um, I, I don't want to get into details on a position, but there's a position that we thought would be reasonably easy to fill uh, in the facilities department, and um, two people accepted the job and then didn't come and turned it down. So it's like, so you know, when retirements happen and you plan the turnover and you plan overlap, not not all the planning works out. And uh, when someone doesn't come, they don't normally tell you why. Whereas when someone leaves, we do a pretty thorough job of asking why. Um, it is a very competitive hiring market, but I, I will say, I, I talked to HR uh, just this week. Uh, knock on wood, we are very close to fully staffed. We, we only have a handful of vacancies, whereas last year at this time, after the override, I think we had 35. We also had retirements and turnover and uh, several new positions. It was just a high amount. So this year it's more like half a dozen. So we're in really good shape. Um, customer service was just finished actually last week. Uh, we all sat through some training. And um, you know, there's $40,000 allocated to this. Um, through town meeting, we pushed some of that to Labor Council because he came in and did some of the training. And they've spent almost all of the rest, which I was really impressed. And, and much of it goes into the future. It's online training that we can all take advantage of for quite some time. So I think it's going to be very helpful. Um, if you ever want HR to come in and sort of give you details about it, they could. You know, that's one of those things that's really up to you. Um, you know, Caitlin and I sat through it, and I know I learned things. You know, I was, I was guessing, you know, which answer's right, and I was like, oh, I should know this. Cripes, I'm the town manager. Oh, I got that wrong. <laughs> So, it, you know, and it's Labor Council, so I would tell, he said, how did you do? I said, I got a couple wrong. He said, good. If you got it all right, you're doing something wrong. So, because we don't run into all the issues all the time, thank goodness. So it was really helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a memo on some of the loose ends. There's not many. There's only two or three. And then that's the end of FY19 goals. Um, it was a lot to do. And we had started some of the work before December, but it was kind of a lot to do. Um, the town calendar and sort of clock is we do a much better job on goals when we can start early because then the project process takes over for us in October. Um, October to February is very busy and then it's town meeting and not everyone's involved in town meeting so that's okay. Uh, but it is the summer is really helpful for us to start thinking about things, working on things. Um, you know, and I, I look forward to the discussion on how you want to approach FY20 goals. Um, Thanks, Bob. When I um, wrote a memo on them, I agreed with some of the comments you made that, you know, I heard what you've said in the past and tried to reduce the number of goals but make them bigger. 
uh, and multi-year. And that'll be important if, you know, if senior centers another goal, for instance, which probably won't be by itself, what does that mean? What do you think we could get done in this year? How many years do you think it would take to complete the thought? So, you know, staff and I have just tried to work on some of the FY20 goals with that in mind. So if there's any questions on FY19, I'll just jump right ahead. Questions on 19, I feel like that's a pretty... I have um, just a couple of small ones. Yep. On the uh, customer service training and providing customer service, I, when when Dan and I were going through the policy, somewhere in there that we didn't we didn't uh, revise them, but I believe it states that um, each department shall have a, like a feedback box. Maybe it's been months since I looked at yeah, this. Yeah, I, I don't remember. Honestly, and that, Andy, I'll check. And that and that they would, um, that would be tracked, or something like that. I'll look. Okay. I'll look into those. But if that's in our policy, I don't think that's a bad idea. Okay. Yep. Um, and but but uh, Vanessa, if it's okay with so, you. So for the public. To yeah. Yeah. For okay. the public to you okay. know yeah. uh, write in there and slip in the box. But I'll find that policy and. and Okay. If it can wait to the next yeah, discussion. That's fine. Um, and then one other thing on employee retention. Um, I was hoping to see, I mean, employee retention, I understand that, that we're almost fully staffed, which is great. Um, but for me, employee retention sort of reflects, you know, how long are we keeping employees? Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, and so, I, I, what I would look f look forward to see are some numbers. Um, you know, for the past several years, how many people have um, retired? How many? Which obviously, okay. um, that's going to happen. Um, how many people left a after a certain duration um, pre-retirement, and uh, whatever else you you folks think might be in something like that. I mean, I think after that person. It's a good point, Andy, that if there are certain departments that were struggling to fill, are they other positions sort of scattered across? Um, things like that would be helpful to know. Okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we we put the goal together, thinking we understood it pretty well, but as time went on, there was really quite a difference between attraction and retention. Those are two very different things. I mean, they're under the same umbrella, but. Yeah. Um, retaining is easier than attracting mm -hmm. because when someone has worked here for a while they understand and they either do or don't like the culture but someone's not here it's hard to explain what the culture of the workplace is unless they hear it and have rep you know we have a reputation mm -hmm. um, but yeah we're happy to try to take a look at statistics um, we are uh, implementing a new HR muni munis module which will help it won't oh. necessarily look backwards as far as you'd like, but mm -hmm. this will be more of a quantitative exercise yeah. going forward, yeah. for sure. Can that come for three years? So the point yeah. I'm brought up in air, two yeah. doesn't seem enough, four seems a lot. Okay. Three, three, seven, 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 eight, 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 eight. Yeah. What might be interesting also is um, on the retention side, can you unbundle unbundle it a little bit to highlight um, areas that are really strong, areas that aren't as strong? If it, I don't know if it's department or right. it's uh, assistant town manager or, or mm -hmm. I'm not trying to point it at a person. No, I'm, I'm trying, trying to think about how to see break it. In other words, you know, are, are there places where it, it's proven we've got more turnover right. versus less turnover? So, f for instance, there's design turnover in some businesses and organizations. Right. Let's say we have design turnover in summer rec help, for instance. Right. Right. So, but a lot of our employees are not not design turnover. So, yeah. Okay. I'll try to think about that some more. And the other one on the HR training uh, with customer service, I would be interested. I don't know if the other members are in kind of hearing a little bit of what kind of training is taking place. Okay. Sure. For customer service. I mean, we, we, we hear of different things at different times, different letters come across the bow. Yeah. Um, it might be good for the public to hear what the training is also. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I can get, should certainly get you a list. And she's not someone that comes up to speak with us with any frequency. We hear from many of the department heads, so it might be nice for her to okay. have her time, too. Okay. Yeah, we can have her visit uh, 
really any time, but probably before the budget process gets too deep. So in the fall, early fall, September, October. September, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> Not July 9th, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> See how late we can go. Um, so as far as setting goals for 2020, um, I don't know if we necessarily want to go down that path now, since I think we're still about a half hour behind schedule. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's something that at our next two meetings, or let me rephrase well, that. Uh, your meetings are really busy, and I urge you to try to get to this now. Okay. Um, I can easily cut this down and ask you very direct questions on a few of these goals. Um, if, if you want, I can just cut to number two right away and say I, I need the board's help in figuring out what this is. So Vanessa and I have had a discussion about it. Um, you earlier alluded to some parts of it. Um, you know, what would the board like to accomplish with its appointed boards is my question. And I, from where I sit, there's clearly a need for more training, I guess I'll say. Um, we, as I mentioned yesterday, this, um, there used to be annual meetings of um, all boards would be invited. Maybe the attendance would be a third to a half of the volunteers, which isn't too bad. Um, the attorney general would come out or someone from her staff and do some open meeting law training, do, the met do some ethics training. And then the board uh, would be left with an hour or two, uh, usually end of the meeting, to do whatever it felt was appropriate. Um, and those worked well for years and then stopped for a couple of years. And then the board tried to start it up again when John Halsey was chair. So I think it was three years ago. And almost no one came. It was at the senior center. Everyone was told, please come. If you can't come as the chair, please send the vice chair or some other member. And I think three or four people came. So. If the board wants to organize the volunteers to accomplish something, we need your help, and we're happy to give you help. Um, just think about what it is you think as board members, other board members need. And, and I can only imagine, um, when I walked into FinCom, it was an extremely experienced board, so I just sat there and learned. Not all your boards are like that, and times change. I got a manual, but it was really what's online now. But I never got a Robert's Rules of Order or whatever, how do you run a meeting? Um, you know, you're asking some volunteers to run meetings and they've never been trained. Yep. So, yep. you know, if, if the board wants to pursue this, we're happy to do it. Um, you saw a couple of thoughts I wrote up on it, but mm -hmm. this is one where I really feel like I need a lot from you if you want to do well, it. Well, um, if I may, um, you last meeting, we discussed, I, I, I don't know how it, it was raised, but the, the idea of an onboarding manual, mm -hmm. I mean, it's in our policy that there should be all, onboarding manuals right. for all the boards and we don't have them. And, and so, so um, the board asked me to start with one for an outline for the select board, which we can talk about uh, later when we talk about future meetings. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I concur with Bob. The, the each board or committee or commission has a mission they're, they're supposed to follow but as far as how to run a meeting and oh, um, you know the, the things that are required of them by uh, the town um, each person should get when they're put on a board or commission or committee or commission a onboarding manual you know not so long as that they won't read it but long enough that that it it has information. Oh, I got to run this meeting. How do I do that? Um, or um, thing, things like that. Yeah. I think maybe we could also talk within that structure about a mentoring program, mm -hmm. where you've got some people that have cut across different boards at different times, mm -hmm. may not may not even be on a board anymore, but they have a wealth of experience. Yeah. And that they we could almost formalize a mentoring activity mm -hmm. to help people understand what to do and also to be able to ask questions every once in a while when, when something's gonna come up. So yeah. I like the concept of this. I think from a practical perspective I have some concerns, but one of the things we could do is, and by we I mean the town staff, um, that 
uh, there could <laughs> be closer. a list of there could be a list of resources uh, from a people perspective. Um, previous people that have served in that capacity, uh, if they're amenable to being on that list, with contact information. If you have questions, these are people that have served for years before you. Um, mm -hmm. They're willing That's to be contacted, so that way. You know, there's a, mi a variety of reasons why people back away from being volunteers, um, but they might still be willing to engage. But they may not want something as formal as a mentoring process. Yeah, or it could be, you know, the, take coffee with a cop and bring it into other venues as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I like that. I think as far as an onboarding manual, um, I, I think it, there's a couple basics that sort of go across the open meeting law, the ethics, and the how to run a meeting. Right. Um, I think these are pretty standard. I yeah. think beyond that, each committee would need sort of some highlights of what they do, maybe a calendar of what their year looks like, yeah. um, a section on finances. So that is something we could, I want to be careful how we put this forward, right? Mm. Because we're now asking something of our volunteers that we appoint to these BC, these boards, committees, and commissions. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, so once every three year. years, you uh, we get to speak with them. We do. I just went through that. I mean, a, so a lot of that. Not to inter interrupt, but to interrupt. Uh, a, a lot of that, sort of the basic requirements of volunteers, um, is outlined in section two. So that can just be taken and put into their onboarding manual. Um, in section two of our policies. Um, right. and, and so they wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel on that. Right. I would see the open meeting law, the ethics parts, um, if maybe that's something staff could do with Ray. Yes. And yeah. I'm talking high level bullets because open meeting law can get really complicated, but for the purposes of an ethics, is, if you've anyone who's, if everyone who's done the training knows, but it, there's some sort of high level things here. That, that are yeah. the do's and in don'ts. In the past, the AG best. has wanted to come out and give these. We haven't asked in a few years, but I would ask again to see if they're still offering. So, them. all I mean, all of our volunteers by law have to do the ethics training online. Correct. Online, um, I, it looks like they have open meeting law webinars mm -hmm. online. Yes, they do. Yeah. Um, so maybe that maybe we. Uh, it's not necessarily a legal requirement, but we ask our volunteer members to to attend a training or. Um, or view a webinar within, yeah. and then they're getting it straight from the Attorney General's office, and yeah. it places less of a burden on staff as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not filtered, or it's not, you know, the interpretation right. of staff of yeah. what the Attorney General's office says. It's just coming straight from them. And then I think, you know, that the Ethics Commission has. Um, a lawyer for the day program which I was I think all or most of our volunteers are probably aware of because of having gone through the online ethics training um, there is similarly a lawyer for the day program with the Attorney General's office relative to the open meeting law but that wasn't something that I was aware aware of previously um, so it, it, I think that could be we could make that a simply a requirement of serving yeah. And, and then I think it puts it might put less of a burden on on staff, um, and would would allow the information not to be kind of filtered or interpreted, yep. but just come kind of straight from the the enforcer of the open meeting law. So. Yeah. Yeah, and at the end of the day, the goal is to lessen the burden on I'm going to call it the chairs and vice chairs for a minute by helping them understand kind of the the hows and, and to, yeah. to make it easier for them, mm -hmm. not that there's some Big brother kind of thing going on. That's not it at all. It really is. Here's how to make it easier. Here's here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to get. Not for ethic, ethics and, and conflict of interest. I get it. Completely different. <laughs> I'm talking about for the other activities in terms of how to how to operate. Yeah. Um, and it's not 100% clear to me that everybody knows what their mission is. Yes. Although in the vast interviews, my question. I always ask the question. Are you aware of your mission? Um, Did you then ask what, what they think it is? Um, what do they say? Yes, I'm aware of my mission. <laughs> well, well. Sorry. Um, so, okay. I, yeah. I think it's a fantastic conversation, but we've also sort of gone off the topic, which is setting Bob's goals for 2020. Right. Yep. So, that was volunteerism. Um, why don't we sort of t 
table this and on the volunteers part. So I, it sounds like Bob worked. I just want to ask, ask you two questions. One, do you think there's some kind of a survey you could give to your volunteers that would be helpful? Mm -hmm. And I've thought about that, but I don't know all the questions to ask. And two, um, I think with some of the board's help, um, if you will, a better marketing is effort is needed on the boards in terms of I want to volunteer. What do I look at? Where do I go? Right. Um, you need to have a more hom homogeneous, here's what we do. Here's all the boards, committees. Here's a one-pager on them. I call it marketing. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's just synthesis. Yeah. No, it's uh, marketing. And that would help it direct <laughs> everyone. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. 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 So that, that's all. Okay. Uh, the only other goal I really wanted to discuss tonight is if the board had an interest in joining in on, on building security governance. Um, the elected boards are all, the, you, the library trust, and the school committee have different legal responsibilities. Um, the school committee will have the rules. They will vote on them. They will carry them forward. They are the policy board. It's less clear whether it's you or me, but it doesn't change to me the involvement. Um, this would involve uh, sometimes agenda items on your board, sometimes collective three board meetings. And it's probably a two or three year time horizon. And it's probably not really something you have to start right away, but I just really did want to introduce it, and, and the schools are going to discuss it at some point this summer, and the library trustees will too. Um, it would be, it's going to be impossible for all three boards to share the exact same governance rules. We know that's not going to happen. It would be really good if you could have as much in common as possible, and then vary when you know you need to vary. Um, so I, I think this is really the area where the town meeting wanted to have more involvement. Like, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Not the hardware, but are you going to, you know, make someone behave in this way? Um, so this is an opportunity, you know, for you to have discussions. And I would think most of it is a public discussion. It could be there's a topic for executive session. We'll learn we'll that. But I just wanted to get that out there for you to start thinking about it, whether you're interested in support. And the rest we can definitely wait on. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we can we can discuss this at a at a different a later time because I know we're running late, Vanessa. Um, I'm interested, yes. From but very interested and yes. and interested um, in 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 having some idea of how how the money is being spent because um, yeah. I mean, we had also talked about at town meeting. Uh, the idea of holding public forums mm -hmm. um, so that residents could raise their concerns. Mm -hmm. So, from a goal perspective, um, understanding when those are going to take place and perhaps what form those might take, I think that would be informative. Okay. Um, beyond that, sort of as I'm looking at this, um, under operations, I see you've cut this down significantly. Yeah. Uh, under operations, you have software review evaluation. Mm -hmm. Is that a goal? Um, I think it should be. We have a new software coordinator position. She's excellent. Um, we have really good technology and we have really good employees, but I don't think we've spent much time knowing how to integrate what technology we have if it's appropriate. Okay. So, for instance, the assessors do something, the building inspectors do something else. Maybe there's a way they can behave together more efficiently okay. in terms of information. Um, legally, there are different responsibilities within town government. Um, so it's not going to change whose authority it is, but it'd be awfully nice if, for instance, the way the assessors looked at a piece of property as, let's say, two-family, and the way the building inspectors know the family, you know, whether it is allowed to be two-family or not, had the same opinion. <coughs> they don't have to legally, which when I first got here, I was really surprised at. So the assessors can tax what they see, and the building inspectors know what's allowed, but the building inspectors are not allowed to get feedback from the assessors as to what did you see. So that's just an example of how inefficient government is by design, and I think software can help us do a better job. Okay. And I think we need to have some discussion with your subcommittee on communication as to how you would like us to communicate to the public. That's just evolving very quickly. Um, we, we tend to still be a little bit website oriented and a little less social media, although Jane and Matt are doing a good job as is police. Mm -hmm. But we'd really welcome your feedback on how to communicate as well. And it's funny, that actually came up with um, the text alert system mm -hmm. that we have, because a message was sent out for writing 375, but we've never used it for elections. Mm -hmm. um, 
It would have only been sent out if there was a traffic implication, so it depends on the event. Right, and I think, you I know. Think down here, yes. Right. Um, but I think that's one area where we can, you yeah. I can talk about okay. best use. I have a question about community conversations. Um, uh, I know that there have been a lot of community conversations, like the Pulse of Reading has been having mm -hmm. some events at the library. Um, is this different from that? No, uh, it's identical. It's the same thing. Yeah, Amy and, and I are working together on it and would like to continue to do that. So I know that there are volunteers involved in mm -hmm. town that facilitate those. Mm -hmm. um, so who, who, who's leading that? The, the, the volunteers, the, the well, library well, I was, director? I was asked at the last meeting to meet with the facilitator and the library director to come up with the next plan, for instance. So who's leading it? It's really collaborative. I think one of the things we can talk about with that and with other things is where where does it go? In other words, the discussion yeah. takes place and some things come up. How do we decide what next? Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah. that there, there's there's some progression from the discussion. Yeah. And so far, um, from from my perspective, I've been an attendee. I haven't really been in the guts of it. And now I'm being asked to take a step forward, so it's appropriate that I tell you that. Yeah. It's also appropriate that I ask you what involvement you would like as a board mm -hmm. or individuals. So, who who asked you? Uh, both the facilitator and library director. Yeah. I mean, Amy's the one that told me, but. And um, hmm. so they didn't ask our permission. <laughs> Why would they? <laughs> I'm, 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 that's a joke. So from, from I think the perspective that's great. of I think what that's we great. want our involvement to be, I think these events have been going very well. I think if they, if the organizers, now that apparently includes you, um, <laughs> would like our involvement, you know, I feel I can speak for everyone and say we would be happy to support and engage and, okay. and participate yeah. in, in whatever capacity they'd like. Okay, I'll um, pass that along. Yeah. But I also want to be cautious that we are not imposing ourselves on mm -hmm. yes. them Understood. in whatever vision they may have for these mm -hmm. activities. Okay. I think that a yeah, number of us have mind. attended as individuals um, okay. a number of times already. Right. I've, I've been to two of them. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I, I, others can, can disagree. I don't think that I was uh, impairing discussions at all. <laughs> um, but it was more kind of, you know, listening, but also participating in, you know, what, what are the things that as a resident, I'm interested in and I'm concerned about. And I want to just make sure that, that that can continue in some way, shape, or form. I think it's interesting. Has anybody else attended? Yes. I have. Yeah. I have. I, that, have I didn't think that. Was your comment directed at that we not be too heavy handed in how these things are run so that the. the the people who have been running them still have control over the situation now, including you, but that the board not direct, you know, sort of get involved in what they're yes. telling them what to do. That was sort of what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. exactly it. As far as I was atta are. attending. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think, no, as attending, as if we go yeah, as individuals, yeah. the only thing I want to be cautious of is that, that we not breach quorum. Ah. Uh, because even if we attend as individuals, if a town issue comes up, mm -hmm. I want to be sensitive to open meeting law. Mm. But I'm not deliberating on that issue yet. Well, and that's where it gets a little hairy, right? Where we've run into this issue right. before. So yeah, with other topics. Point. So I just something yeah. to be aware of. And now of. it's explicitly, you know, a town manager. And goal. now it's our now it's a goal. right. Yeah. So if, if we attend, we just can't. you know, yeah. maybe they did Maybe more. that's why they did this. They didn't want us to attend. <laughs> yeah, very effective. But you can be posted and attend. That's right. not a problem. We just have to know. But yeah. I I agree with you, Bob, that there it is really encouraging to hear it with community events and the community conversations. Um, level of satisfaction and positive feedback. I think as town leaders, we also need to be sure that we're receptive to people's concerns right. that, they're, that they're expressing and, and meet them where they are. Um, because if there, there is happiness and satisfaction, there's also some unhappiness yeah. and yeah. lack yeah. of satisfa satisfaction. So. And on, on top of that, the um, <coughs> back to the marketing discussion also. So the number of people attending these is 
there could be more, and there could be more mm -hmm. different people. And if there are ways that we can, as, mm -hmm. as a board or as board mm -hmm. members, help that, it, it, yes. everybody. Right. Yes. But how can we make it, how can we make people feel like it's important to attend because you're able to share your opinions, um, and that something happens from it. It's not just kind of a, a, a session we're gonna we're gonna make posters mm -hmm. everybody, but <laughs> let's you know, from there, here's what's gonna happen or here's what can happen. And I think it's important then that board members all board members have a chance to attend some of these meetings and listen and hear what's going on and then maybe it becomes part of our agenda to take action on some or maybe more on your agenda actually yeah I say so far I've been to I can't remember I think three um, I was really impressed that the people come to these meetings that I have not seen in a long time night meeting I may know them in some other way in town but not because they're on the chicken circuit uh, circuit as they call the bank um, these are people that <laughs> Honestly, in some cases, I hadn't seen for eight or nine years in town um, because they don't, they're not town meeting members, they don't come to this meeting, they don't watch. They just thought this is something interesting, this is something different. So I, I absolutely agree more people I wish would come, but we're seeing a good set of people who are there that don't normally engage with us. And it's been really interesting to hear their comments. Do you think that's because it's been at the library? Yes. And, yeah. So, do we have any other comments on the goals that Bob has presented? Anything we'd like to add or change? We can revisit. You can certainly come back and do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it'd be good to come back. I, I, I just I was sketching just some quick thoughts in terms of kind of structure and answering your question about what, what do I do when something's more than a year. Right. Mm. And it struck me that, again, I just scribbled it so I thought it through really well, but there are kind of three categories. There's operations, initiatives, and aspirations. Kind of short-term, medium-term, long-term. And maybe that's an interesting way of thinking about it, that there are going to be some in certain categories, although probably less in operations. That's more kind of, you know, you doing mm -hmm. your job. Initiatives, you talked about software as an example. That's an initiative. That's like, we need to think about how to pull all this together. And then I had no idea that we we're getting ready to replace Munis at some point. So we're hoping not to, but the vendor has warned us. So yeah, so it, it's like not, at some point they're gonna stop supporting it, like that bad? Um, Microsoft bought them and said they were gonna go yeah. to uh, different products within 10 years. That was oh. seven years ago, but oh. they've realized they tried experimenting on Florida and making them all take what they wanted. And the state of Florida just blew up. So they realized we can't, the municipal space is complicated. <coughs> yeah. We can't just be Microsoft. So, I, But that's a concern. Yeah, so that, that to me is an, an initiative, right? Um, and maybe it makes sense that that has multiple years of activity with this kind of a, a startup and maybe we can come up with some definitive goals in year one, but it's gonna track longer than that, it's gonna continue. And the aspirations piece, and again, I just threw these words down for a second, is really kind of long-term planning stuff. Visions visions, structural changes, okay. something like that. And, and maybe we, you know, we can bucket some of these things that way, but it just it struck me that maybe we need to figure out a way to talk about multiple year yeah. goals. Yeah, that and maybe great. that helps it. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. next thank up you. on the agenda, um, discuss eco-friendly initiatives. So I, I put this on here. Um, I've attended a variety of um, events, meetings, conferences um, uh, outside of town um, on issues like this. And I wanted to throw on the agenda to see what the board thought about, you know, taking some initiatives, what other towns are doing. Um, you know, we have RMLD, I've mentioned the solar uh, programs that they're putting into place. Um, you know, we don't hear a lot. There, there are certain initiatives I know switching to LED bulbs that the town has undertaken in certain capacity from a cost-saving measure. Um, but we also don't we don't hear about them. Um, yeah. You know, do we want to put in more electric vehicle charging stations? There's the possibility of converting some of our vehicles um, to electric, not the cop cars. Um, <laughs> You know, is composting something you want to do? I was reading that you know, waste management and recycling um, are set to become much more expensive in the coming years. So, what initiatives can we start talking about now, so that when those changes come, we're prepared for it? Um, you know, the rubber mulch discussion has come up. 
um, that they have at some of the schools. So, you know, nothing really concrete, but I, I just wanted to initiate it and get a feel for what the board was thinking and, and if these are areas that we're interested in pursuing, then how we take those next steps. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. I think that, well, first of all, the world is changing and, and to kind of sit back isn't going to help. We need to kind of figure out where we can participate, where it's helpful, where it furthers kind of uh, resident feedback in terms of activities that we could possibly do, um, and kind of what what we can do to kind of encourage that activity. Um, a lot of things now, it, it used to be that there was a cost disincentive to doing a lot of things. That's mostly gone in a lot of these initiatives now. Yeah. Um, but they need to be revisited and, and see what's possible. So at the meeting, the RMLD meeting we were at, mm -hmm. one of the discussions came up that RMLD would, um, I think, support an RFP, was that mm -hmm. the discussion? Yep. Uh, to make an assessment of where solar panels could go, where it would make sense, municipal mm -hmm. buildings, and, and mm -hmm. school buildings and activities. Um, and we, we probed, a little, I probed a little bit. <laughs> Said, what, what would the process be? What, what are you looking for? They've already done that. Well, so Maybe the technology has changed. It has. So I think in terms of where yeah. things could go, they may already okay. know that. Uh, but now to kind of put it together with current costs and, okay. and estimates may make a difference. Um, and it sounded like they would be willing to financially participate in certainly the, the uh, RFP side of it mm -hmm. and see where it goes. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, I was a little surprised that there are so many communities doing stuff in solar and other areas where we're not. Um, just to take a look at it. I think one of the reasons, just to put it in perspective, that we don't and that the uh, engagement rate for solar panels is so low in our multis district is because our electricity is cheaper, right? right. As opposed to having, to you know, a national carrier. So, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue it anyway. Thoughts? Another thought um, is around, and, and I don't know background in Reading on this, but um, 240 cities and towns in Massachusetts are designated as green communities. Mm -hmm. um, Reading is not one of them, and I, do, I don't know if that's something that the town has looked into previously. Um, but Our multi is pursuing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, because we have a municipally owned utility, yes, it puts us in a slightly different. It makes it harder because many of the initiatives that um, the green community is um, sort of it sets as um, markers for mm -hmm. success. Our multi already does, so it, it sort of makes it harder for us to meet those thresholds. Um, I went to Sierra Club conference and they talked about this, so. But they are trying to pursue it anyway. So that we get the label. Um, but the, the, it looks like there's also a Green Communities Division um, at the state level that assists cities and towns mm -hmm. in helping them find clean energy solutions that reduce long-term energy costs and strengthen local economies. Mm -hmm. So that could be something to look into. I don't know if that's something that RMLD does or if we do it on the town side? I think it could be both. I mean, I know our multi, they actually mentioned yeah. it okay. last week, um, but that's certainly something. And that, you know, one of the reasons why I put this on this particular agenda is because as we're talking about you know, town manager goals, is this something that we want to ask Bob to look into mm -hmm. um, from mm -hmm. uh, what our peer community is doing? You know, is that something we want to do? Mm -hmm. but, you know, just throwing it out there. I went to, uh, we have a Reading Climate Advisory Committee who are um, very knowledgeable in, mm -hmm. in this area. Um, and I went to a meeting of theirs uh, and, and I wrote up about it and a, a member of FinCom was there in a private capacity but, but potentially having um, one of our members um, just one, so we don't have this, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and um, to increase, sort of, there are somewhat silos um, between um, different groups, mm -hmm. and the Climate Advisory Committee is already working with the RMLD, but I think there could be more collaboration, and I think uh, with 
if, if we made it, um, I think it's very important. I think it's, I think it would be to see, have Reading be a, a, uh, um, a leader in uh, renewable energies and um, sustainability, I think, is probably the better way to put it. Um, that may attract residents, that may attract businesses. I'm sure there's a, you know, uh, a business angle we could use, or, or we, we could accrue some business benefits from it as well. Um, so so I, I, I support this a lot. I mean, I think uh, what was discussed at the uh, Climate Advisory Committee is, getting away from um, getting into renewable energy sources is 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 a, the primary push that they, that they see and, but they have other they have other ideas there they're a great committee um, they encouraged individual members to come up with their own ideas that we'd like to see happen in town um, so but I think it should be one person um, in on the board that that sort of uh, talks to these people, uh, and I don't think it should be me. Um, I think so it sh I'd, should be. I'd love to take this one, yeah. sort of one that I'm particularly interested in. There's definitely a financial aspect where we could benefit yeah. um, from certain cost-saving measures that could be implemented, um, both short-term and long-term. So if the board's okay with that. I can reach out to the Climate Advisory Committee and our yes. and. Yeah, that, that would be fine with me. Would it be helpful at some point uh, for the facilities department and possibly others to come in and update you about what we have done so you're aware? I think that would be great. Yeah, they only really talk a little bit in the budget process and otherwise you yeah. would know. Yeah. Um, and that's why I know some, some of their, done some things. Yeah, yeah, and some of their work is now six, seven years old in performance contracting and it could be time for another round, if you will. Okay. So, okay. I think that's great. Let's yep. move on to the future. Okay. I think um, close to the topic, if I could. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that I think we can do more closely with the like board. Um, I with think who? RLD. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. So, as it relates to new building construction that's going on, mm -hmm. maybe looking into lead certification and other things that would involve RMLD. Um, at this downtown district meeting, we had a discussion about, you know, could RMLD play a role in helping either lamp or relamp mm -hmm. businesses? It, you know, part of that is, you know, it's RMLD's bailiwick, but it really is part of the town's discussion of how do we bring in new businesses. There was also a discussion at this meeting, sorry, I gave a somewhat incomplete description. <laughs> it, it would be hard to give a complete description. Yes, it would. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things that people talked about was um, downtown lighting and having soft, comfortable lighting for walking you know, in the streets of downtown. RMLD probably could have a big role in, at least in that discussion. And how do we kind of bring our economic development activities together with RMLD and I'm sure Climate Advisory and other parts also. How do we? Yeah, well, and, and one of the that things that's come up before is from a CPDC perspective, um, requiring new construction to include electric charging stations. Right, so there's a yep. lot of yep. cross community Great overlap. board um, work that could be done. Right. Great, so I will take that and run with it. Bob, we can work on putting yep. that on a future agenda. Okay. I'd point out, I think it's important, the re I didn't, it's not that I didn't want to get involved. The Climate Advisory Committee, I, you know, they're a great committee and I feel passionately about it, but I think it needs to be someone who is a liaison to the RMLD, to RMLD, and then you can easily bring in the Climate Advisory Committee. That sounds great. Okay, so we'll close that up. Next up we have future agendas. Um, which we've sort of touched on throughout the evening. Mm -hmm. But Bob, can we revisit July 9th? <laughs> yes, just <laughs> Because that one's looking like a doozy. Mm -hmm. So you have um, town council scheduled to come to talk about liquor policy violations that I believe Caitlin's already advertised, 7-15. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I don't know for sure, but tentatively we think that uh, Austin Prep will be in to require or to request uh, your permission to do something uh, on their property. Okay. We'll see. Uh, if, if they do come in, I've allocated half an hour because I think it's something that you just don't know about. You're going to have to hear, and it's usually we like to present something to you and then later ask you to have an opinion. This this can't work that way. Okay. Um, you've got the rescheduled uh, depot uh, renovation or, or painting. Mm -hmm. um, CPDC and, and today the ZBA or, or maybe tomorrow will be invited to also attend and discuss zoning changes proposed for November town meeting. That should be a short discussion. Uh, PTTF is in to talk to you, and that could take all night. It's a whole lot of safety improvements, including uh, our favorite Havel Street. Um, I'm going to, a number of us are going in on Thursday to talk about that with Mass DOT. Okay. I also had a conference call today on downtown. Um, the southern section will be paved this summer. The northern section will not be paved this summer. And by, by now, it's July. We kind of figured that. And after uh, Thursday, I'll have more updates for you about the northern section. Um, it, it, it's, it's better if you can do this uh, election decision that night, but uh, Laura said if you did it in August 6th, it would be okay. I would really like to do that July 9th. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know board members' availability, and July 9th is the only meeting you're all planning to come. Yeah, I think thing. that's a big one. I think we need, if it, it means we go a little later, I think that's okay. Okay. Uh, and then in August, again, the first one's a little more fleshed out. This is Victor on the Board of Assessors visiting you. I don't think we need to have this CONSCOM meeting because that was going to depend on how this Chapter 61 land issue got resolved. And this was right at the deadline. So that can move uh, and can be uh, a different topic. It's the waste zero recycling. Um, that's a new al Jane. alternative that the town is being presented that Jane is happy to share with you. So again, it's towards some of the things you were just discussing. Wow. Great. She just figured she's in to discuss policies with you. She'd wrap a couple of related issues or issues that are deep I'll watch the video after the fact. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you're not going to be there. Um, I don't think, yeah, and I don't think any votes are needed that night. This is just a lot of information you're going to hear. And then some mm -hmm. you may need to uh, have a vote, including the second water meter. Um, late August, again, uh, finance policies will then wrap up the policy issue. Sharon will be in. Um, I don't know really what the warrant looks like. I'm aware of four or five articles. So, you know, your second agenda, item, second meeting in August is a little lighter at this point. And then you can see it thins out as it always does. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is an important one. Economic development is scheduled for September 10th. Um, you know, that's on everyone's calendar. I mean, some of the other things that we talked about, not necessarily for July 9th, mm -hmm. um, but it's the early Sunday start time for Birch Meadow. Yep. The building security update. Okay. You have seen your tax relief on here. Mm -hmm. And now the DPW update on their sustainable projects. Right. Uh, facilities. Yep. Oh, and economic development committee update. Right. Um, for August. How do you want that? Here's your July. Uh, oh, these are, yeah, for, for August. August. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll for talk the to Mark and Andy about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Mark and I. <coughs> Um, when do you think we'll be ready to propose something from our subcommittee to the board? Uh, I think an update in August makes sense. I don't know that we'll be ready. Yeah. But to tell so the board to finish where, so yeah, sort sort of what's what going. Yeah. yeah. And to make sure that the board has a chance to offer some feedback at that point. Right. I don't think it'll be horrifically long. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Andy and I were hoping for July 9th, which I know is very, very <laughs> packed, um, to vote on an update to the ad hoc committee oh, language. Okay. Um, we want to make sure one, we want to make sure that the, the language appointment language reflects the actual membership of the committee as well as fits fairly within the charter and might allow us to, um, the, the, the ad hoc has been interested in possibly having some additional members to um, represent a, a broader cross-section of our community, including a couple of students. So um, 
can we put that at the end of the agenda? And if we don't get to it, we can take it for August. Would that be? That would be. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so then I think we are done on that. Anything else that you want that I anybody have, might want I have added? Just one small thing. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. Um, I have an outline for a uh, onboarding manual. I don't right. think that is um, time sensitive because hopefully we won't have any new members until uh, <laughs> the next election cycle. Uh, why don't we push that to Bob? Uh, September, October. That sounds great. I'll send the outline to you, Bob. Okay. I mean, it's it's extremely basic. Okay. And then you can have it for. Great. So if there's nothing else there, we will. Oh, question. sorry, Bob. Um, since FinCom's not meeting tomorrow, um, and I hope they're meeting Monday, they have not set a schedule yet. Um, some of the meetings they're going to be having in the fall are going to need your attendance. So I may have some back and forth communication with you and your availability. Um, we're thinking there's probably two financial forums this uh, mm -hmm. this fall. One is really for outside capital, building security, whatever, and then the other is normal budgetary things. The first one probably happens in September. The second one could be October. Okay. But I just want to put on your schedules that there's other meetings that are going to be important to fit in here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have um, we have executive session on the agenda. Bob, as a point of clarification, we have collective bargaining. Is this? You can cross out on the motion and also interest in real estate and just do collective. So before we go into executive session, uh, we do need to wrap up the real estate portion. We discussed this earlier in the evening um, as far as our interest or lack thereof in this parcel of land. So my recommendation would be that we vote that we are that we, as the board, will not be pursuing the right of first refusal to purchase this land. Um, that way, the interested buyer can move forward with the sale in a timely fashion. Okay. Can we have a couple okay. of questions about that first? Of course. So, the, who actually owns the land now? Is it the town? No. Okay, it's privately held. Privately held. No. Okay, and that's the right of first refusal coming through. There's a purchase and sale in place. Correct. Okay, and so it's pending our letting go of this right of first refusal. That's correct. Conscom has come back and said that they don't really see any great value. We talked about it being pretty far from yep. the downtown. Um, right. And small. And small. And expensive. And expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I will. We don't think it would serve any of our cap just big capital needs. It, no. so, yeah. At point six of an acre, it's and why do remind me why we have the right of first refusal? Oh, because it is what, Chapter 61A, I think, land. That's just legally the town has the right. And there's a lot of land up there that falls under that chapter. Okay. So I, I don't remember this ever coming up before. Okay. So, you know, it's not common. Okay. Okay. Um, so I would suggest we move to decline. Do we have a motion drafted or not? Um, not draft 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 draft. Draft. Move that the board not pursue the right of first refusal as presented. We can fill in the address. Okay. I'll let Mark write that out. And the property is at, what's the address? Let's go. 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 let 1310 Main Street. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Move that the board not pursue its right of first refusal on the property at 1310 Main Street. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. All those in favor? Okay. okay thank Motion you. carries. Great. So now uh, we do need to go into executive session for collective bargaining. Minutes, maybe. What was that? Maybe minutes. Oh, thank move, you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Move <laughs> that the make sure we do this right. Move that the select board move to executive session. Oh, we're gonna do minutes Wait. first. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Otherwise, we gotta come back. Got it. Uh, right, because I was gonna say we're not gonna come back. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. So, can you move uh, to approve the meeting minutes of June fourth, twenty nineteen, as amended? Do we have the as amended in our packet? Or is it amended since? So, it's if, it's choose if we choose it? to make it yes. Oh, yeah. okay. So let me, Boyer. Am I, I missing? Like towards the therapy. Oh, here we are. Okay. Six. Um, All right. Love the new numbering system. Yeah, it is great. Oh, it is. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, that's nice. Okay. I had a comment on page 62, but if anyone has a comment on 61. Why don't you go ahead? We might jump it, around a little bit. It's, 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 relative, it's relatively minor, if I can just find my, where I wrote it. Uh, under the... Um, FY20 election schedule discussion. Um, several members, at least I think I, I noted that, and I think Ann might have said this as well, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that greater uh, participation, greater voter participation uh, in making this deci decision would be a high priority and that, that it was noted that combined elections result in greater voter participation. Um, do, do members rem uh, I, I, I do remember? I thought that I said that. Point. But um, uh, I said that that was a, a pro. I don't know if I said pro or pro. something. Yeah, it was a pro. Yeah, because yeah. I think it had been listed as a as a con, which in, in Laura's presentation, which from an administrative. Uh, perspective, mm -hmm. it had the potential to be because of having to recruit right. um, That's more right. more staff, um, and the, the, when, when the ability to do that was was an open question, depend with mm -hmm. with the timing and when people are living in Florida versus Massachusetts <laughs> and that kind of thing. But the reality that it would allow for greater participation, that aspect being a on the pro side from a, a voter engagement perspective. That's what I, I think. Yeah, so maybe something it. like um, several members noted that. Um, Turnout's better with the combined election. Turnout is better with the uh, yeah. and, and that we consider that a, um, something other word than pro. And plus. Yeah. That, 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 that would be in a plus to, uh, to having the combined election. Something, yeah. That sound okay? Yep. You got that? I got it. Okay. I have no edits. Um, I'm fine. And I don't envy you having to write up all of those motions, so thank you for that. Oh my goodness. No. It was, wow. Uh, well, I had a lot of them somewhat done because I gave you the motions and the things. Right, but right. I had to go and change who voted what uh, and then yeah. Yeah. the second. And I was going through oh, yeah. this and like. <laughs> <laughs> At least um, I read them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, any further edits? I, I just had one under role of liaisons. We, we recommended onboarding. I thought we recommended onboarding manuals for BCs, including the select board. But uh, we didn't go quite that far. We didn't go quite that far. Yeah, it was it was for us. I think we hadn't. I think it was to start. Yeah, yes, to, to start, start with. Right. That's right. Yes. There was a discussion on that, and uh, but. So may maybe um, it doesn't really fit well with role of liaisons, does it? So maybe. Uh. Well, I mean, you started the onboarding discussion right after. In that first sentence, is the board agreed an onboarding manual for the select board themselves would be a good idea? Ah, yes, yes, yes. So it's literally yeah. right after yeah. the role of liaisons mm -hmm. Thank discussion. Thank you. Yep. They kind of rolled into your next discussion. Right. Okay. Excellent. That's true. Okay. Thanks, All right. Caitlin. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor? Of the of the minutes as amended? Yes. Okay. Second. Yes. And also yes. <laughs> <laughs> did we have a second? Yeah, I think I had made the motion before. Yeah, we had the motion. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. Uh, great. So now, Ready. Mark, if you can read the motion to take us into executive session. Move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and that the chair declare that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the body and not to return to open session. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Do we have to roll call this? Yeah. yeah we have to roll call, call this. Andy? Uh, Friedman, yes. Ann? Yes. Mark? Yes. Vanessa, yes. Okay, thank you. Let's go. 
to the gavel to exit. Uh, and uh, we not, we're not expecting to come back. And Correct. We will not be returning. We will be adjourning from executive session.